Park Row Books and Harper Audio presents Local Woman Missing by Mary Kabika. Performed by Brittany Presley, Jennifer Jill Araya, Gary Tiedemann, and Jesse Valinsky. Prologue. Eleven years before. There's a smudge of lipstick on the collar of his shirt. She sees it. She says nothing about it. Instead, she stands there, bobbing the crying baby up and down like the needle of a sewing machine piercing fabric. She listens to his lame lies, his same dispassionate, sorry I'm late, buts, he reels off almost every night. He must have an arsenal of them amassed, and he uses them in rotation. A bottleneck on the expressway, a coworker with car trouble, Getting stuck on the phone with some apoplectic policyholder whose house fire wasn't covered because of insufficient documentation of the damage. The more specific he is, the more sure she is of his betrayal. Still, she says nothing. If she presses him on it, he gets mad. He turns it around on her. Are you calling me a liar? For this reason, she lets it go. And also because it would be a double standard for her to make a big deal of the lipstick. It's fine, she says, taking her eyes off the lipstick. They eat dinner together. They watch some TV. Later that night, she puts the baby to bed, feeding her at the last minute so that she won't wake hungry while she's gone. She tells him she's going for a run. Now, he asks. It's after 10 o'clock when she steps from the bedroom in running clothes and shoes. Why not? She asks. He stares at her too long, his expression unclear. When people do dumb shit like this, they always wind up dead. She's not sure what to make of his words, whether he means running alone late at night or cheating on one's husband. She convinces herself it's the first one. She swallows. Her saliva is thick. She's been anticipating this all day. Her mind is made up. When else do you expect me to go? All day long, she's home alone with their baby. She has no time to herself. He shrugs. Suit yourself. He rises from the sofa and stretches. He's going to bed. She goes out the front door, leaving it unlocked so she doesn't have to carry keys. She runs only the first block so that if he's watching out the bedroom window, he sees. At the corner, she stops and sends a text. On my way. The reply. See you there. She deletes the conversation from her phone. Is she as transparent as her husband? Is what she's doing as obvious as the lipstick on his shirt? She doesn't think so. Her husband is hot-blooded. If he had any idea she was sneaking out to hook up with some guy in his parked car on 4th Avenue, where the street dead ends a hundred feet from the last house, he'd have beaten her to within an inch of her life by now. She walks along the street. The night is quiet. It's the only time of day she looks forward to, lost in the anticipation of some guy she hardly knows indulging her for a while, making her feel good. He isn't the first man she's cheated on her husband with. He won't be the last. After the baby was born, she tried to quit, to be faithful. But it wasn't worth the effort. This guy says his name is Sam. She's not sure she believes it. She's been seeing him off and on for months, whenever he or she gets the urge. She met him when she was pregnant, of all things. To some guys, it's a turn on. He made her feel sexy, despite the extra weight, which is far more than she could say for her husband. Like her, Sam is married, and he isn't the only guy she's been seeing on the side. The few times they've been together, Sam takes his ring off and leaves it on the dashboard, as if that somehow mitigates what he's doing. She doesn't do the same. She isn't one for feeling guilty. She's made herself believe that it's her husband's fault she does what she does. Turnabout is fair play. The sky is full of stars. She stares at them a while, finding Venus. The night is cold and her arms are covered with goosebumps. 
She's thinking about his car, how warm it will be once she gets inside it. She's looking up at the stars when she hears something coming at her from behind. She spins around, eyes searching the street but coming up empty in the darkness. She chalks it up to some wild animal rummaging through trash, but she doesn't know. She turns back, goes back to walking, picking up her pace. She's not one to get scared, but she starts thinking of what ifs. What if her husband is on to her? What if he is following her? What if he knows? She tells herself he doesn't know. He couldn't know. She's a very good liar. She's learned how to silence her tells. But what if the wife knows? She isn't sure what Sam tells his wife when he leaves. They don't talk about things like that. They don't talk much at all except for a few preliminary words to kick things off. Don't you look pretty. I've been waiting for this all day. They're not in love. No one is leaving their spouse anytime soon. It's nothing like that. For her, it's a form of escapism, release, revenge. Another noise comes. She turns and looks again, truly scared this time, but finds nothing. She's jittery. She can't shake the feeling of eyes on her. She starts to jog, but soon trips over an untied shoe. She's uncoordinated and nervous, wanting to be in the car with him and not alone on the street. The street is dark, far too dark for her liking. She senses movement out of the corner of her eye. Is something there? Is someone there? She asks, who's there? The night is quiet. No one speaks. She tries to distract herself with thoughts of him, of his warm, gentle hands on her. She bends over to tie the shoe. Another noise comes from behind. This time when she looks, car lights surface on the horizon, going way too fast. There's no time to hide. Part One Delilah Now I hear footsteps. They move across the ceiling above my head. My eyes follow the sound, but there ain't nothing to see because it's just footsteps. That don't matter none, though, because the sound of them alone is enough to make my heart race, my legs shake, to make something inside my neck thump like a heartbeat. It's the lady coming, I know, because hers are the bare feet, while the man always wears shoes. There's something more light about her footsteps than his. They don't pound on the floor like the man's do. His footsteps are loud and low, like a rumble of thunder at night. The man is upstairs now, too, because I hear the lady talking to him. I hear her ugly, huffy voice say that it's time to give us some food. She says it like she's teed off about something we've done, though we've done nothing. Not so far as I can tell. At the top of the stairs, the latch unlocks. The door jerks suddenly open, revealing a scrap of light that hurts my eyes. I squint, see her standing in her ugly robe and her ugly slippers, her skinny legs knobby kneed and bruised. Her hair is messed up. There's a scowl on her face. She's sore because she's got a feet gussing me. The lady bends at the waist, drops something to the floor with a clang. If she sees me hiding in the shadows, she don't look at me. This place where they keep us is shaped like a box. There's four walls with a staircase that runs up the dead center of them. I know, cause I've felt every inch of them rough, ruddy walls with my bare hands, looking for a way out. I've counted the steps from corner to corner. There's 15, give or take a few depending on the size of my steps and if my feet have been growing or not. My feet have, in fact, been growing, because those shoes I came with no longer fit right. They stopped fitting a long time ago. I can barely get my big toe in them now. I don't wear no shoes down here anymore, because I stopped wearing those ones when they hurt. I got one pair of clothes. 
I don't know where they came from, but they ain't the same clothes I was wearing when I got to this place. Those stopped fitting a long time ago. And then the lady went and got me new ones. She was put out about it. Same as she's put out about having to feed Gus and me. I wear these same clothes every day. I don't know what exactly they look like, because of how dark it is down here. But I do know that it's baggy pants and a shirt that's too short in the sleeves, because I'm forever trying to pull them down when I'm cold. When my stink reaches the lady's nose, she makes me stand cold and naked in front of Gus while she washes my pants and shirt. She's got words for me when she does. Ungrateful little bitch. Because then she's sore she's got to clean my clothes. It's pitch black where we are. The kind of black your eyes can't ever get used to because it's so dang black. Every now and again, I run my hand in front of my eyes. I look for movement, but there ain't none. If I didn't know better, I'd think my hand was gone. That it up and left my body. That it somehow tore itself off of me. But that would have hurt, and there would have been blood. Not that I would have seen the blood on account of how black it is down here. But I would have felt the wetness of it. I would have felt the pain of my hand getting tore from my body. Gus and I play chicken with ourselves sometimes. We walk from wall to wall in the darkness. See if we'll chicken out before we run face first into the wall. Rules are we gotta keep our hands at our sides. It's cheating if we feel with our hands first. The lady calls down from the top of the stairs, her voice prickly like thorns on rose bushes. This ain't no restaurant and I ain't no waitress. If you want to eat, you've got to come get it for yourself, she says. The door slams shut. A lock clicks and there are the footsteps again, drawn away. The lady wouldn't bother feeding Gus and me, but the man makes her do it, because he... Ain't gonna have no blood on his hands. I've heard him say that before. For a long while, I tried to make myself not eat, but I turned dizzy and weak because of it. Then the pain in my belly got to be so bad that I had to eat. I figured there had to be a better way to die than starving myself to death. That hurt too much. But all that was before Gus came, because after he did, I didn't want to die no more, because if I did, then Gus would be alone. And I didn't want Gus to wind up in this place all alone. I push myself up off the floor now. The floor is rock hard and cold. It's so hard that if I sit in the same spot long enough, it makes it so I can't feel my rear end. The whole darn thing goes numb. And then after numb, it tingles. My legs are worn out which don't make no sense, because they don't do much of anything except sit still. They've got no reason to be tired. But I think that's why they're so tired. They've plumb forgotten how to walk and to run. I slog to the top of the stairs, one step at a time. There ain't no light coming into this place where they keep Gus and me. We're underground. There's no windows here. And that crack of light that should be at the bottom of the door ain't there. The man and the lady that live upstairs are keeping the light all to themselves. Sharing none with Gus and me. I feel my way up the stairs. I've done it so many times, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to see. I count the steps. There's 12 of them. They're made of wood so rough, sometimes I get splinters in my feet just from walking on them. I don't ever see the splinters, but I feel the sting of them. I know that they're there. Mama used to pull splinters out of my hands and feet with the tweezers. I think of these splinters living in my skin forever. And it makes me wonder if they fall out all on their own. Or if they stay where they're at. Turning me little by little into a porcupine. There's a dog bowl waiting at the top of the steps for Gus and me to share. I don't see it either, but I feel it in my hands, the smooth, round finish of the dish. There was a dog in this house once, but not no more. Now the dog's gone. 
I used to hear it barking. I used to hear the scratch of nails on the ceiling above me. I would make believe the dog was gonna open the door one day and set me free. Either that or eat me alive, cause it was a big mean dog from the sound of it. The lady didn't like it when the dog barked. She'd tell the man to shut it up. Either you shut it up or I will. And then one day the barking and the scratching disappeared, just like that. And now the dog's gone. I never did lay eyes on that dog. But I imagined it was a dog like Clifford, big and red, on account of the gigantic bark. Inside the dog bowl is something mushy like oatmeal. I take it back downstairs. I sit on the cold, hard floor, lean against a concrete wall. I offer some to Gus, but he says no. He says he ain't hungry. I try and eat, but the mush is nasty. My insides feel like they might hurl it all back up. I keep eating anyway, but with each bite it gets harder to swallow. I have to force myself to do it. I do it only so that my belly don't hurt later on, cause there's no telling when the lady will bring us more food. My mouth salivates, and not in a good way. Rather, it salivates in that way it does right before you're about to throw up. I gag on the mush, vomit into my mouth, and then swallow it back down. I try to make Gus eat some, but still he won't. I can't blame him. Sometimes starving is better than having to eat that lady's food. They've got a little toilet down here for Gus and me. It's where we do our business in the dark, hoping and praying the man and the lady don't come down when we're on the pot. Gus and I have an agreement. When he goes, I go in the other corner and hum so I can't hear nothing. When I go, he does the same. There ain't no toilet paper in this place. There's no place to wash our hands or any other part of us for that matter. We're dirty as all get out. But things like that don't matter no more, except for when our filth makes the lady mad. We don't get to take no real bath in this place. But every now and again, a bucket of soapy cold water arrives, and we're expected to strip down naked to use our hands to scrub ourselves clean, to stand there cold and wet while we air dry. It's damp down here where they keep us. A cold, sticky wet, like sweat. The kind that don't ever go away. The water oozes through the walls and trickles down sometimes when it's raining hard outside. The rainwater pools on the floor beside me making puddles. I walk in them puddles with my bare feet. In the dark, I hear something else splashing in them puddles sometimes. I hear something scratching its tiny claws on the floor and walls. I know that something is there. Something I can't see. I got ideas, but I don't know for sure what it is. I do know for sure that there are spiders and silverfish down here. I don't ever see them either. But sometimes when I try and sleep, I feel their stealth legs slink across my skin. I could scream, but it wouldn't do any good. I leave them be. I'm sure they don't want to be here any more than me. I'm not alone down here, not since Gus came. It makes it better, knowing I'm not ever alone, and that someone is here to bear witness to all the things the lady does to me. It's usually the lady doing the hurting, cause she don't got an ounce of goodness in her. The man has maybe an ounce, cause sometimes when the lady ain't home, he'll bring down a special treat, like a hard candy or something. Gus and I are always grateful, but in the back of my mind, I can't help but wonder why he's being kind. I don't know how old I am. I don't know how long they've been keeping me here. All the time, I'm cold. But the lady upstairs couldn't give two hoots about that. I told her once that I was cold, and she got angry. Called me things like ornery and ingrate. Words that... I didn't know what they mean. She calls me many things. 
If I didn't know any better, I'd think my name was just as easily retard or dipshit as it is Delilah. Come get your dinner, dipshit. Stop your whining, you little retard. The man went and brought me a blanket. He let me sleep with it one night. But then he went and took it away again so that the lady didn't find out what he'd done. I don't know the difference between daytime and nighttime anymore. Long ago, light meant day and dark meant night. But not down here, it don't. Now it's just all dark all the time. I sleep as much as I can, because what else is there to do with my time than talk to Gus and play chicken with the walls? Sometimes I can't even talk to Gus because that lady gets mad at us. She screams down the stairs at me to stop my yammering before she shuts me up for good. Gus only ever whispers, because he's scared of getting in trouble. Gus is a fraidy cat. Not that I can blame him. Gus is the good one. I'm the one who's bad. I'm the one always getting into trouble. I tried to keep track of how many days I'd been down here. But there was no way of doing that, seeing as I couldn't tell my daytimes from my nights. I gave that up long ago. The sounds upstairs are my best measure of time. The man and the lady are loud now. Trash talk mostly, because they ain't ever nice to each other. I like it better when they're loud. Because when they're quarreling with each other, then nobody's paying any attention to Gus and me. It's when they're quiet that I'm scared most of all. I set the dog bowl aside. I did the best that I could. If I try and eat any more, I will vomit. I offer some more to Gus, but he says no. I'm not sure how Gus has made it this long on account of how little he eats. I never get a good look at him in the darkness, but I imagine he's all skin and bones. I've caught glimpses of him when the door opens upstairs, and we get a quick scrap of light. He's got brown hair. He's taller than me. I think he'd have a nice smile, but Gus probably don't ever smile. Neither do I. The spoon chimes against the bowl. I reach down and take hold of it in my hand. For whatever reason, I get to thinking of the way that lady comes downstairs sometimes. I don't like that nun. She only comes when she's hopping mad and looking for someone to take her anger out on. Gus must hear the jingle of the spoon. He asks what I'm doing with it. Sometimes I think Gus can read my mind. I'm keeping it, I say. Gus tells me that a round spoon isn't going to do nothing to hurt no one, if that's what I've got my mind set on, which it is. You're just gonna get yourself in trouble for not giving the lady back her spoon, he says. I can't ever see the expression on his face, but I imagine he's worrying about what I'm gonna do. Gus always worries. I tell him, if I can figure out a way to make it sharp, it'll hurt. I'm banking on that lady being so soft in the head, she'll forget all about the spoon when she comes to get her bowl. I put the rest of the mush down the toilet so she don't get angry and call us names for not finishing her food that she made. I put the empty bowl at the top of them steps and start thinking on how I'm going to make this round spoon sharp as a spear. There ain't much to work with in this place where they've got us kept. The man and the lady don't give Gus and me no stuff. We've got no clothes other than the ones we're wearing. No blankets, no pillows, no nothing. The only thing we have aside from the floor and the walls is each other and that icky toilet on the other end of the pitch black room. It's only after I try to sharpen my spoon on the walls and the floor that I decide to give the toilet a go. I don't know a thing about toilets, other than that's where I do my business, and that ours has never once been cleaned. The darkness is a blessing when it comes down to the toilet, because I don't want to see the inside of it.
Not after all this time that we've been crapping in there and no one's been cleaning it. The foul smell alone is enough to make me gag. Where are you going? Gus asks as I take my spoon to the toilet. Gus and I have a way of knowing what the other is doing without ever really seeing what the other is doing. That comes from living down here long enough and getting to know each other's habits. You'll see, I tell him. Gus and I speak in whispers. I'm pretty sure the man and the lady who live upstairs aren't home right now, because I heard the doors opening and closing not too long ago. I heard their loud footsteps go suddenly quiet. There's no one up there talking now. No one screaming. No noise from the TV. But I can't be sure. Because if they are here, I don't want them listening in on Gus and me and knowing what I'm doing with my filched spoon. I'd get a whipping if they did. Or worse, I ain't ever tried to run away before or make myself a weapon. But common sense says that's got to be a worse punishment than not finishing the lady's nasty dinner or telling her I'm cold. I let my hands float over the toilet a while. I feel it up for a sharp spot. But the toilet is smooth as a baby's bottom. I almost give up, not thinking I'm going to find a spot to sharpen my spoon here. It's all one part, except for the top of it, the lid which I discover by accident comes off. I hoist it up in my arms. It's heavier than I thought it'd be, all dead weight. I almost drop it. What's the matter? Gus asks, panicked over some noise I make. I think that Gus is younger than me, on account of how chicken he is, even if he is taller. But anyone can be a chicken, no matter what their age or size. Nothing's wrong. I tell him, not wanting to think what would have happened if I did drop the lid. I set it gently upside down on the floor. I tell Gus, don't worry about it. Ain't nothing the matter, everything's fine. Gus is a worry wart. I wonder if he's always been that way, or if the man and the lady have done that to him. I wonder what kind of boy Gus was before he got here kind who climbed trees and caught frogs and played ghosts in the graveyard at night, or the kind who read books and was afraid of the dark. We tried talking about it once, but then I got sad and wound up telling Gus I didn't want to talk about it no more, because most of my earliest memories have that man and that lady in them, and in them they're doing wicked things to me, things that I don't like. That man and the lady saved the newspaper from when I went missing. The lady read those stories out loud to me, telling me what happened to my mama, showing me pictures of my daddy standing in front of our big blue house, crying. She told me how the police was looking for me. But then soon after, she rubbed it in and gloated, saying that the police weren't looking for me no more. She told me then that I was old news, and that they got away with taking a kid that wasn't theirs. Stealing kids, she said. It's the easiest thing in the world. I go back to investigating the toilet. I discover that that tank is full of nasty water, which I mistakenly plunge my whole arm into, right up to the elbow. I cringe and shake it dry not knowing if it's pee or what. Then I get down on the ground and run my fingers along the inside of that toilet tank lid. The inside is much different than the whole rest of the toilet. It's gritty and coarse, not the same baby's bottom smooth. My fingers come across a jagged ridge on the inside of it, like a lip. That jagged ridge might just do the trick. Gus is worried sick that whatever I'm planning won't end well. I've tried for a long time to make him see we ain't got no other options if we ever want to get out of this place. But that there's the problem with Gus. He'd just as soon stay here than risk getting caught trying to leave. I run the edge of the spoon back and forth on that ridge. I get my knuckles caught on it time and again and feel them getting scraped up. 
It burns like heck, but I keep at it. It takes a long while, but eventually the ridge of the toilet tank lid begins to mangle the spoon. Not spear sharp, but uneven. The kind that promises to get sharp the longer I work with it. You shouldn't be doing that, Gus says. Why not? I ask. They'll kill you. I run my finger along that botched edge, feeling hopeful for the first time in a long while. Not if I kill them first, I tell Gus Beck. I ain't ever thought about hurting or killing a person before. That's not my way. I don't got a mean bone in my body. Or at least I don't think I did before coming to this place. But being locked in the dark does bad things to a person's mind. It changes them. Turns them into something new. I'm not the same person I was before that man and that lady stole me. If it wasn't for Gus, I wouldn't have survived so long in this place. Gus is the best thing that happened to me. I don't know for certain when Gus arrived. All I know is that he showed up out of the blue one time when I was dead asleep. I went to sleep, and when I woke up, he was there, crying in the corner, worse off than me. That man and that lady, he told me, had opened up the basement door, shoved him down them steps, locked up behind him. Gus was 12 at the time. Only God knows if he's still 12. What Gus told me when he stopped his crying was that they used that big red Clifford dog of theirs to cajole him into their car, just like fish and bait. Poor Gus liked dogs. And he couldn't help himself when the lady smiled kindly at him and asked if he wanted to pet her dog, which was sticking its big red head out of the car window. Gus had been at the playground that day, playing ball with himself when they stole him. Shooting hoops. There wasn't anyone around to see them go. His ball got left behind. I wondered why Gus was playing ball alone, and if that meant he didn't have any friends. But I never asked him. Things like that don't matter anymore anyway, because now he's got me. Day and night, I continue to work on my spoon. I don't know how long I've been going at it, but I've whittled it down enough that I've gotten myself a point. It ain't the best point ever. It's jagged and uneven. But at the top of that spoon, the metal thins to a sharp tip. When I stab it into my finger, it hurts. I'm too chicken to stab it hard enough to make it bleed. But before too long, I'm gonna have to. I've gotta test it. I've gotta know if it works. I lost track of how long I've been carving this dang thing. Long enough that my hands tired as all get out. Gus offered to do it for me, but I said no, because I didn't want him getting in trouble. I know he doesn't want to help because he's scared half to death of what I'm doing. He was just trying to be nice. But if someone's going to take the fall for this spoon, it's me. I hide that spoon when I ain't working on it. I hide it inside the toilet tank. Put the lid back on and cover it up. But it's not hidden now, because now I'm working on it, even though the man and the lady are right upstairs. I ain't got no other choice if we're ever gonna get out of here. I've got the lid off the toilet. I'm going at it full tilt with my spoon when I hear the lady declare to the man that she's gotta feed us. There ain't no warning then, because the door yanks suddenly open, and there it is again. That thin scrap of light that hurts my eyes. All at once, that lady's at the top of them steps. Come get your dinner, she says. And I don't make a move to go, because usually when she says it like that, she just sets the dog bowl there at the top of them steps and leaves it for us. But not tonight. Because tonight, when we don't come, she says, How many times have I told you before that I ain't your dang waitress and this ain't no dang restaurant? You better get your ass up here and get your dinner in five seconds or else. Five, she barks out, keeping count. I look at Gus, but he's scared stiff. I gotta be the one to do it, 
because Gus is frozen in fear. He can't move. Four, she says. And before I know it, the lady's counting down faster than I can get my spoon back in the toilet, get the lid quietly on and push my sleepy legs up off the floor and run. I'm not dumb. I know how many seconds it is till she reaches one, and it's not many. I remember how to count and do math, because my minute math worksheets are one of them things that I do in my head when I'm bored to death. I know that the lady will be at one in no time flat. Three, she's saying. I ain't ever gonna get there in time. My hands and legs are shaking. My heartbeat is thumping loud. I catch a glimpse of Gus out of the corner of my eye as I go running by. He's sitting on the floor with his legs pulled into him, scared as heck, wanting to cry. The lady reaches one right around the same time my feet hit the bottom step. She's up there at the top of them steps, looking down at me. I gotta squint my eyes to see her because my eyes ain't used to the light. She's standing up there holding her nasty meal in the dog dish. I hear her ugly laugh when she gets to one. She's delighted in having me run scared. You ain't hungry, she asks, standing smugly at the top of them steps like a know-it-all. She don't wait for an answer. Before I can get a word out, she asks, you think I got all day to sit around here and wait for you to come get your food? No, ma'am, I say, my lips quivering. No, ma'am, what? She asks sharply. No, ma'am. I don't think you got all day to sit around and wait for me to come get my food, I say, the words rattling in my throat. You ain't hungry? She asks. And I gotta think a minute about what the right answer is. I am hungry. I'm just not hungry for her food. But if I tell her that, she'll be angry because she went to the trouble of making me food. I am hungry, ma'am. That lady tells me, it would be good for you to show some gratitude from time to time. I ain't gotta feed you, you know. I could just leave you here to starve to death. Sorry, ma'am, I say. My eyes stare hard at the floor so I don't have to see her ugly face. She asks me, what were you doing down here that it took you so long to come? I don't like the way she's looking at me, like she knows something she shouldn't. My stomach churns, thinking maybe she knows I've been up to no good. I feel myself stiffen there at the bottom of the steps, but my spoon is tucked away inside the toilet where she won't ever find it. My spoon is safe, and because of that, so am I for the time. I lie and say, I was sleeping. What's that you say? She snaps, suddenly madder than she was before. Up there at the top of the steps, her face turns beet red. I realize my mistake too late. I was sleeping, ma'am, I tell her. I ain't ever supposed to say anything without saying ma'am at the end. I'm supposed to show some respect for all that she does for me. Otherwise, I get punished. The lady's quiet for a long while. She's just looking at me, staring. I don't like the quiet because when she's quiet, she scares me most of all. Looks like someone ain't gonna eat tonight after all, she says. And then she mutters under her breath, ungrateful bitch. She turns away from me and takes her slop with her. At the top of them steps, she slams the door closed and turns the lock. I step backward and drop down from the wooden step to the concrete floor, thinking that if that's the worst she's got for me, taking away Gus's and my dinner, then I got off pretty easy this time. But I'm no dope. I know that's too good to be true. That lady hasn't fed us since that day I forgot to say ma'am. Not that I want to eat her nasty food. But just because I don't want to doesn't mean that I'm not hungry. It doesn't mean that I don't need to eat.
I don't know how much time has passed since that day she tried to feed us last. It feels like weeks. At first, I was hungry as could be. But then, strange enough, that feeling of being hungry went away. Only to be replaced with something else. Something worse. For the first couple of days, all I thought about was food. Until I was sure I could smell and taste the foods I was thinking about. Now I don't think about it much anymore. Now I just think about what it will be like to starve to death. I wonder if I'll just go ahead and die in my sleep. Or if I'll know the moment I stop breathing and my heart stops beating because I'll be gasping for air or something. The lady hasn't brought us nothing to drink either. I'm thirsty as all get out. Gus and I went without water long enough that we got to drink in that dank water in the back of the toilet tank because it was all that we got. We've been taking baby sips only, not knowing if or when it will run out. We don't ever drink nearly enough to quench our thirst. We're still thirsty as heck. I'm not the only one around here who's hungry. Gus is hungry too. I hear his tummy grumbling, but Gus don't say nothing about being hungry. Though we both know it's my fault he is. Gus is sleeping now. I'm trying to sleep, but I got too much on my mind to sleep. Now that the lady's starving us to death, I know we gotta get out of here if we don't wanna die. We gotta take the next chance we get to run, if we ever get another chance. I've been doing my calisthenics. It ain't easy because after all this time not eating, I'm weak as can be. My legs don't work right. And if I'm gonna stand a chance of running away from here, I gotta get them ready. I've been spending my time jogging in place, leaning down to touch my toes, marching laps around Gus and my dungeon while he watches on, asks what I'm doing, begs me to stop. Gus don't like the idea of us running away, cause he's scared as heck we're gonna get caught. I shrugged when he said that and said, maybe we will, maybe we won't. But how do we know if we don't try? I told him that when I go, he's gotta make sure he's right behind me. He can't drag his feet cause we're better off dead than getting caught. I sit now with my spoon in my lap. I keep it close. It's not a spear. I don't think it'll ever be a spear. But it's mangled enough that it's got a chiseled point and could stun someone, if not kill. Stunning someone might be as good as it gets, but it's better than nothing. All of a sudden, the door creaks open. I hold my breath. It ain't the lady coming. It's the man. I can tell by the sound of his footsteps, though he's trying to be quiet which tells me the lady is somewhere up there too, but she don't know he's coming down to see Gus and me. I grip my spoon. The last thing I wanna do is hurt the one who's been nice to me, or nicer, cause keeping kids in your basement ain't ever nice, even if you aren't the one hitting them. But sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, and the man is the least suspecting of the two. I'm ready, or at least as ready as I'll ever be. I've thought this through a gazillion times. In my head, I know what to do. But still, that don't mean that my heart isn't going hog wild. My arms and legs is shaking, and I know I've got to get a hold of them if I'm going to do this right. I take a deep breath, count to ten, release it. Where are you at? The man is asking, hissing his words out into the darkness. Gus says nothing. Right here, I say, gripping my spoon so tight it hurts my hand. He comes to me. He says he's got a candy bar for me to eat. I hear the sound of him unwrapping it. Far as she's concerned, we might as well leave you down here to starve to death. But don't worry, I won't let nothing bad happen to you.
He's trying to sweet talk me to make up for her not feeding us for all this time. He feels badly about it. He slips the candy bar into my hand. Go on, he says. Eat it. This ain't the first time the man's brought me chocolate. He brought me a cupcake once, because he said it was my birthday. I don't know if it was. I bring the candy bar to my mouth. I set my lips on it and taste the chocolate. It's richer than I've ever tasted before. I sink my teeth slowly in. This candy bar is the kind with nuts. It's got something gooey inside. That gooey something falls to my chin. Tasting so sweet that I want to cry. I can't remember the last time I ever ate something so sweet in my whole life. I nibble at it, because I want this candy bar to last forever. I should save some for Gus. Gus would love this candy bar. And Gus needs to eat far more than I do. He's wasting away. But I don't want the man to think I'm ungrateful. He's probably got another one for Gus anyway. I take another bite. The sweet sugar rushes through my bloodstream. I make a sound. You like that? The man asks. Standing so close, I feel his breath on me when he speaks. It stinks. It's good. I say back with a hunk of chocolate in my mouth. It sticks to my teeth. That gooey something like glue. The man is trying to wheedle me. He talks soft, buttering me up. And I don't know if it's because he feels bad about the lady starving me, or if it's because he's got something else on his mind. I got more where that came from. Whenever you want, it's yours. All you've got to do is ask. The man is standing so close. Wherever the lady is at, she don't know that he's here. There may never be another chance as good as this. I'm nervous, because I'm thinking about all the things that could go wrong when I try and stab him with my spoon. The fear almost gets the best of me. I almost talk myself out of it. But then I get to thinking about Gus spending the rest of his life in this place. And no, I've got to do it for him. I've got to get Gus out of this place if it's the last thing I ever do. I hold the spoon tight, wrapping my fingers around the belly of its handle. I got only one chance to do this right. I don't plan to aim for anything in particular. It's too dark to see where I'm aiming anyway. I just gotta stab and see where it lands. The man is telling me what a pretty girl I am. When I take a deep, terrified breath and reach out and jam that spoon as hard as I can into him, if I had to guess, I'd say I hit somewhere around the side of the man's neck because of where he's standing. When I stab him, the tip of the honed spoon goes into him. I know because it don't feel like a dead end when I touch skin. It don't go far, but it goes, leaving behind more than a scratch. The man lets out a screech. It ain't a knife I have. It's something far lesser than a knife. One run through isn't going to work. I grab my spoon out of this man's neck and spear him again and again. I don't know how much damage I'm doing, but by the sounds he's making, it hurts. The man falls to the ground, taking me down with him. He's grunting, clutching himself, calling me names. I try rising up to my legs. As I do, he reaches out and tears at my hair with his sweaty hands. I pull away, feeling some of my hair go with him. I let out a cry and keep going. The man reaches out again, but this time I'm standing upright. He gets my leg and tries tugging on it to keep me from leaving. I kick at him. I got only my bare feet, so that don't hurt none. But I kick hard enough that his hands let go, because he can't hold on to me no more. I got him on the floor. From the sound the man's making, he ain't gonna be quick to get up and follow me. I call to Gus. Come on! As I go charging up them steps, I must have dropped my spoon, because I don't have it anymore. At the top of them steps, I lay my hand on the door handle and turn. 
I hear Gus's scared footsteps on the stairs behind me. He's walking from the sounds of it. When I need Gus to run, I tell him to hurry up. There's a pounding in my head, a ringing in my ears. Gus is crying. The man downstairs is making a sound. It's not so much a scream as it is a bellow, but it's loud enough that I'm starting to wonder how far it carries. Far enough that the lady will hear? Once upstairs, I have no idea where I am. I have no idea where I'm going. The only time I've ever been up here before was when they first brought me to this place. For those first two seconds before they pushed me down the steps and locked up tight behind me. I don't remember it. It's dark upstairs, but unlike downstairs, it's not black as pitch. Here and there is a faint glow of light that helps me see. I called a gust to hurry up. I don't know how far he is behind. One quick glance over my shoulder tells me he's there, but lagging behind. I know Gus is scared to death, and I try and reassure him that everything will be all right. This ain't no time to be scared, Gus, I say, trying not to be mean about it, but firm. We gotta go. You gotta run. I reach back and grab a hold of his hand, pulling him with me. His hand is cold as ice. Gus says nothing, but every now and again I hear him cry. I hear that lady's voice somewhere in the distance, half asleep and confused. Eddie? She's calling out. What's the matter, Eddie? The man is making his way up the stairs now. He figured out how to get himself up off the floor, though he's still groaning as he chases after Gus and me. I hear the man scream to the lady, breathless and mad. The little Bitch got out, he said. She's getting away. What? The lady asks. How, Eddie? How in the hell did that happen? That man lies and tells her, I don't know how. He's telling the lady they gotta find me, that they can't let us get away. I find a door on the wall. I can just barely make out the square shape of it in the faint nighttime glow. I reach for the handle, but the door is locked up tight. My sweaty hand feels up the door, landing on the lock. The man and the lady are getting closer. I know because they're still screaming at one another, telling each other which way to go to find Gus and me. Calling one another idiots, telling each other to turn on a light so that they can see. Their voices feel close enough to touch. They try and negotiate with me, saying things like, if you tell us where you are, we'll give you a cookie. As if I'm dumb enough to fall for that. No cookie is good enough to live here the rest of my life. But then, in the blink of an eye, they go from negotiating to mean. Because right after their offer for a cookie, they're calling me a bitch again. Saying, I'll kill you when I get my hands on you, you little bitch, you dumb twat. They know this is my doing. They know Gus ain't so naughty as to try and run on his own. My sweaty hand turns that lock and the door miraculously opens. There's a rush of air on the other side of it. It's hot and sticky, hitting me like a wall. It comes barreling into me and I freeze. Cause I ain't ever felt it in all these years that I've been here. Fresh air. The outside world immobilizes me at first, but then I get a hold of myself, because if I don't, I'm easy prey. Because when the front door opened, an alarm on the house started screaming. If the man and the lady had any question about Gus and my whereabouts before, they know now. The lady hollers that we're getting away. I force myself outside. I start running. I've still got Gus's hand in mine, and I pull on it, dragging him with me. There's fear in being outside as much as there is in staying inside. I haven't been outside in a long time. I nearly forgot all about outside. The heat and the darkness swallow me whole, and I run faster than I ever have in my life. I drop Gus's hand by accident, but I pray that he can keep up. Gus hasn't been doing his calisthenics like me, so there's no telling what kind of a runner he is. But sometimes being scared makes you do things you didn't know you could do. My bare feet run across pebbles first, and then the grass. 
The pebbles cut into my feet, hurting, making them bleed. So I'm not paying any attention to things like that. The grass, when I get to it, is soft and wet, tickling my feet. But I can't feel that either. Not really, because I'm just running. I see something shining in the sky. The moon. Stars. I forgot all about the moon and stars. I hear the buzz of nighttime bugs around me. I want to stop and stare and listen. But I can't. Not yet. Not right now. Stay with me, Gus! I scream back over my shoulder, knowing we've got to get far, far away from this place before we stop to look back. For all I know, that man and that lady are just 20 paces behind, and they'll catch us if we stop for a breath. I ask Gus if he's coming, if he's okay. I tell him to stay with me, to not slow down one bit. We're almost there, Gus, I say. We're almost free. For a while, I hear that man and that lady calling after us. They're quiet mostly because they don't want to cause a commotion. They got flashlights with them, though, because I see the glow of those flashlights moving through the trees. Every so often, the light falls on Gus and me, and I duck away from it, veer off in some different direction so that soon I'm all turned around and couldn't find my way back to that house if I wanted to. But then, after a while, I can't hear the man and the lady no more, which is a relief, but it also terrifies me. I wish they'd make some sort of noise so that I'd know where they are. Have we lost them? Or are they hiding in the trees, waiting for me? It's dark outside, mostly. It's still nighttime. The moon and the stars light the world a bit, make it so I can somewhat see. After all that time in the basement, our eyes are accustomed to the darkness. It gives us an advantage over the lady and man. They're not used to seeing in the dark like Gus and me. I don't know where we're at. There are houses, a street, but there aren't too many houses, and what there are is broken up by trees. The trees are big and tall, but not the kind that are big enough that Gus and I can hide behind. The houses are tucked into the trees, and they're dark, hardly a light on anywhere. The grass everywhere is overgrown. It reaches right up to my knees, and it's chock full of prickly weeds that scratch at my bare feet and legs. They're knife-like, stabbing me and making me bleed. I run headlong into a tree branch, stunning myself. For a minute, I see stars. My knees lock and a freeze in place, trying to get my bearings. What happened? Gus asks. But before I have a chance to tell him, I hear the snap of a tree branch from somewhere behind. And no, we've got to keep running if we're to survive. I say, let's go. I take off again. I hear the sound of Gus's heavy breathing behind me. After a while, neither of us says another word, because we got to conserve our breath for running. I trip over a felled tree. I go soaring to the ground, where I land on my hands and knees. It hurts, my knees mostly, but I can't lie there on the ground and cry about it. I get myself up, dust off my hands and knees, and keep running. Watch out for the tree, I whisper to Gus as I go, knowing he's got to be just steps behind me. Though his breath is getting harder and harder to hear over the sound of mine. My legs are getting worn out from all the running, my feet heavy as lead. My heart is beating hard on account of being short of breath and my fear. I'm scared as hell, wondering what that man and that lady would do to us if they caught us. Now that I got a little taste of freedom, I don't want to die. I run fast past houses. I cut through yards. I run down the road. A ways down, my legs become tired as all get out. Gus and I ain't got a lot of options. There are a handful of houses, but what are the odds that anyone would open up for us if we knock on their door in the dead of night? I'm not sure we can risk it. We're sitting ducks if no one lets us in. Hiding out seems like the better choice. I start looking for a place to hide. My running has slowed down some. We're no longer being tailed by the flashlights, but I'm not so dumb as to believe the man and the lady plum gave up and went home. They're playing games with Gus and me. 
in the backyard of one of them houses, I spy a shed tucked beneath a gnarled tree. Come on, Gus, I call, knowing the shed would be as good a place as any for us to hide. In here, I tell him, spotting a padlock on that shed door, but seeing that it ain't locked up tight, we can still get in. I silently remove the padlock from the metal loop and open up the hasp. The shed door pipes when I open it up, so I don't open it all the way. Just enough to get in. I slip inside, make room for Gus. But Gus doesn't come. He must have fallen farther behind than I thought. I gotta wait for him to catch up. Only when I'm in, tucked behind the shed door, do I allow myself a look back? I hold my breath waiting for Gus to materialize in the yard in the darkness of night and join me in the shed. But Gus ain't there. I look all around and call quietly for him. Gus ain't nowhere. I hear footsteps. I hear the mashing of leaves beneath someone's feet, like someone's chomping on chips. I hear the sound of breathing, of heavy huffing and puffing. And though I hope and pray it's Gus, I know it ain't. Cause that's the same huffing and puffing that man was making when he was first chasing after me. I'm in that shed. I got the door pulled too. It ain't closed up tight cause I was looking out for Gus when the footsteps came. I slinked back into the blackness of the shed when they did. I wasn't quiet enough cause that man hurt something. Something brought him to me. Now he's inches away. I'm crouched down into the corner of the shed, tucked behind a big old garbage can. There ain't a whole lot of room in this place because it's chock full of stuff I can't make sense of in the dark. I can feel my whole self shaking. I gotta sit on the wood floor, pull my knees into me and wrap my arms around them to keep from shaking so much I rattle the stuff around me. I'm wondering where Gus is. I'm thinking that if the man is here, then that means he don't have Gus. But maybe the lady has Gus. Or maybe Gus is hiding in his own shed. Cause even though he's a scaredy cat, Gus ain't an idiot. He can take care of himself. The man's footsteps encircle the whole entire shed. They come to a stop right there by the door. His heavy breathing makes me breathe faster and louder so that I gotta hold my breath to keep from giving up my hiding place. I gotta press my hands to my mouth so that the noisy air can't get in or out. The heartbeat inside my neck is going so wild it makes me dizzy. I got a cold sweat going on. I feel like I could pee my pants. I can't hold my breath forever. I take one small, quiet breath, and then press my hands to my mouth and hold it. The moon on the other side of the shed door is bright. It lights up the man, shines on him standing there just outside the open doorway. It makes him glow. I see the shape of him. I see his pointy chin and his straggly hair, his big nose. He's an ugly man, just like the lady's ugly. He ain't super tall, not nearly as tall as my daddy was when I remember him. The man turns toward the shed door and opens it up all the way. The door whines, sad that the man is coming in. With that door all the way opened up, the moon comes warming into the shed too, brightening it some. Not a ton, but enough to scare me, cause with the moonlight on me, I'm not as invisible as I thought. I close my eyes and burrow my head into my knees, try and make myself small. I hear the click of the flashlight turning on, through my closed eyelids, I barely see the blaze of light as it goes roving around the inside of the shed, bouncing off walls. I ain't ever been so scared in my whole entire life. The garbage can is tall and wide, taller and wider than me. I'm crouched so low my body hurts. I got myself rolled into a ball, just like pill bugs. I ain't breathing much, just enough as I have to do to keep from turning blue. But they're half breaths that I take, never letting enough air in or out so that my chest aches and burns. I pee myself. My soft pants fill with it, turning soggy. 
The light from the flashlight moves on and gets dimmer. But it doesn't go completely away. He's investigating some other part of the shed. The moments tick by at a snail's pace. With my eyes closed up tight, I can't see nothing. But I imagine the man investigating every crevice, every nook and cranny in that whole entire shed looking for me. I start wondering, worrying that I got a foot stuck out, that the sleeve of my shirt or a clump of dirty hair is somewhere where he can see. Because even though I'm hiding behind that garbage can, what if all of me ain't tucked neatly back? The shed door squeals open even wider. One loud footstep tromps into the shed with me. Then another, then another. He's coming inside the shed. Next thing I know, he's all the way inside the shed with me. I hear that man's heavy breathing. I smell his rank breath. He's saying words, telling me he knows I'm there. Come out, come out, wherever you are. He sings songs. And if it wasn't for that, I think he did see me. But I'm no idiot. Whatever that lady thinks. I'm no twat. If he knew where I was, he'd have me by now. But a hunch is all the man's got. He swears blind that he ain't gonna hurt me none. Just come on out, little girl, and I'll take you home. I don't believe him. Or maybe I do. Except home is not my home. He don't intend to take me back to daddy. No, this man intends to take me back to his home and lock me back in that dungeon of his. After he teaches me a lesson about stabbing people with spoons. I curl more tightly into my pill bug ball. I hold my breath. I bite my lip and clench my eyes shut tighter. Because somehow not seeing makes it feel less real. Something inside that shed goes crashing down. I start. It takes everything in me not to scream. Whatever it is, the man knocked it from its place, trying to scare me out of my hiding place. Something else falls. He's knocking things down on purpose. I peek one eye open and see a box of nails spilled on the wooden floorboards. They're sharp as daggers. I think of all the bad things this man could do to me with them nails. He's madder than I've ever seen him. I brought out the devil in him when I went and stabbed him with my spoon. I hear the lady's voice hissing from the other side of that shed wall. She's calling for the man, telling him to stop making such a racket because someone will hear. You see her? The lady asks. She in there? The man lets out a big, long breath. Then says, not in here. The flashlight light falls away from me. His footsteps retreat, and he goes outside. On the other side of that wall, they're talking quiet-like, making a plan about how they're gonna find me. He's gonna go one way, she's gonna go the other. I make a plan, too. I'm gonna stay right here. The man asks, everything good back home? And I know that's when he's talking about Gus. All good, the lady says. And I know then that that lady did snatch Gus and bring him back. Now Gus is locked in the dungeon without me. Or maybe he's dead. Because that's the best way they could punish me for what I've done. By hurting or killing Gus. I want to cry. But I can't cry because crying would give me away. I could give myself up and go back to living in that dungeon of theirs with Gus. But I can't. One of us has got to live through this ordeal and tell the rest of the world where we've been all this time. For Gus's sake, now more than ever, I've got to live. Light noses its way into the shed with me. It comes in through the slats of the wooden boards. It's a golden yellow, something I ain't seen in years. Seeing the sunlight nearly makes me cry, but I don't cry because crying won't do me any good. I've got to keep my wits about me if I'm going to try and find my way home. The shed, now that I see it in daylight, 
is old and rickety. There's a lawnmower and a ladder in here, and a bunch of broken bikes. I rise up to my feet, try and step around them, but my legs are half asleep on account of the way I've been sitting. I never did sleep all night long. I spent the whole night crouched into a ball, waiting for that man to come back. At some point in the middle of the night, it started raining. I heard them raindrops pounding on the roof, and every now and again, a stray raindrop snuck into the shed with me, landing on my arms and face. I tried to gather that rain into the palms of my hands and drink it, but there wasn't ever more than a couple drops of it. I'm so thirsty. My throat is bone dry. I ain't drank in days. My lips is dry too. They're split so that on them I feel blood. I run my tongue over that blood and taste it. When it was raining, it took everything in me not to go outside, to leave the safety of the shed, and turn my face up to the sky with my mouth open wide. But I was scared to death the man was waiting for me on the other side. So I settled on just drinking one stray raindrop at a time. My body hurts now from running the way I did. There's dried blood on my hands and legs. That's from tripping over the tree. My feet are covered in blood too. There's wood chips and pebbles stuck in them. It hurts to walk, but I do anyway, cause I got no other choice. In the sunlight, I see scars on my arms from who knows what. Probably all the times that lady went and hit me with her belt. Or the time she threw hot water that smelled like a swimming pool on me. That hurt like heck when it wasn't itching half to death. I go to the front of the shed, but I don't go straight outside. I stand in the doorway first, looking out, surveying my surroundings. I don't know where I am. I don't know that I'm alone, that I'm not being watched. There's a house outside. It's big and white and fallen down. It's got a slant to it. The porch is uneven and a broken window is patched up with red tape. Smoke comes from the chimney, which is the only way I know that the house isn't abandoned, that someone still lives there. The world outside the shed is wet from the rain, though it ain't raining no more. The sun is just starting to come up. The sky is full of puffy clouds and shades of pink and blue. Seeing colors like that makes me gasp. I haven't seen colors in nearly forever. I have to think a minute to remember the names of them. There's yellow beneath the clouds, the sun sitting there where the sky meets land. The earth itself looks fuzzy to me. Like there's clouds coming up from the ground too. The world is overwhelming and big. I find myself missing the darkness of the enclosed basement. Cause even though it was the worst place in the world, something about being shut in made me feel safe. There was only one way in or out. No one was gonna sneak up on me without me knowing. But here, bad things can come at me from any direction. The sun is getting to be so bright, I can just barely open my eyes. I feel danger everywhere, lurking, hiding out where I can't see it. The shed feels safe and enclosed to me, like the basement. I have half a mind to lock myself inside and stay put. I gotta give myself a good talking to to work up the nerve to leave. I take a hesitant step out. I put my bare foot on the wet grass. There's a puddle there. It's mud splattered and warm. But still, I drop to my belly and take a big long swig of the dirty water before standing back up. I decide right away that I'm not going to go to that house and see if anyone is home. Because I don't know who lives there and what kind of people they are. I don't know if they're the kind of people who would snatch up children that ain't theirs and keep them. Instead, I move unnoticed across the yard and to the street on the other side of it. The street is at first dead quiet. There's more than one house, 
but they're all the same, big and white and run down. They're spread apart with land between them, so that I gotta walk a while to get from one house to the next. I don't walk in the street. Instead, I walk in the ditch beside it, so that when a rare car comes soaring past, I drop down in that muddy ditch and hide. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. I've never been in this place before, not so far as I know. But I don't know where the house is that the man and the lady kept me. I don't know what it looked like from the outside. With all my running last night, I got turned around. I couldn't ever find my way back. Which makes me think that the man and the lady could be living inside any one of these houses here. That Gus could be inside any of these houses here. That the shed where I spent my night could have just as easily belonged to them. I'm worried about Gus. But I don't got any idea what to do. All I know is that I gotta save myself first before I can save Gus. The thought of that knocks me sideways. It just don't feel right leaving Gus behind. Though I know if I go back to the man and the lady, we're both dead. I try and memorize my surroundings. If I'm ever gonna find my way back, I got to remember things like the fence, which sits waist high and is brown, falling down. I gotta remember them smokestacks billowing not so far in the distance. I gotta remember the houses, which are old, every single one of them, with paint that flakes off. There are trees on one side of the road, but on the other there is a field with crops that grow. I go to the crops and snatch an ear of corn for myself. For a moment I hide myself in the field and take a bite of that corn, not remembering the last time I ate, but especially not remembering the last time I ate something that wasn't mush. The corn is hard and starchy. It ain't tasty at all. It hasn't been cooked. But that don't matter at all. I'm so hungry I'd eat dirt if it was my only choice. I rise back up to my feet when I finish that corn. I'm tired, but I don't got time for napping. I trudge on through the edge of the cornfield, which hides me some. It's not easy on the feet. The ground here is mushy from last night's rain, and soon the bottom half of me is covered in mud. The sun keeps coming up. After a while, it dries the puddles some. It warms my skin so that I go from cold to hot real quick. The fields thin, and little by little, trees crop up so that soon I'm marching through a forest. Like the corn stalks, the trees hide me too, though I hear the street not so far from here. I hear the cars go zooming past. In the woods, I cross a little creek. I pause for a sip of water. I splash a handful of it on my face and hands, cooling me down, washing the caked on blood away. I rub it over my arms. It feels good, but it don't do nothing to get rid of the scars. The sun is hot now. It burns my eyes. I keep them trained on the ground, cause looking anywhere up hurts bad. My eyes aren't used to the sunlight. I don't see the lady and her little girl and dog come walking through the woods at first. It's the dog that sees me. I turn sharply at the sound of its bark, rise up quickly from the creek and think about running. Energy floods my legs and I nearly bolt. But the dog is small and white. It yaps more than it barks, its tongue hanging out sideways. Its little tail wags like it thinks that seeing me is the best thing in the world. The girl says hi. She says it about a gazillion times. Like it's a new word she's learned, and she's trying it on for size. They put me at ease. I don't bolt, because the dog and the little girl are pleased as punch to see me. The woman is slack-jawed. Her eyes are wide, and she's pulling on the leash, trying to stop the dog from running to me. But then, by accident, the leash slips from her hand. The dog breaks away and comes running. At first, I flinch. Cause it's been a long time since I've seen a dog. 
And here this dog is jumping on me, licking me, peeing. That's Cody, the woman says. Her voice is kind. He won't hurt you. He just gets excited when he meets new people. She says, come in closer to pick up the dog's leash. But she leaves him where he is, because the dog is nice. And after a quick second, I'm not scared of it no more. The woman is looking strangely at me. I have no idea what I look like. All I can see is my arms, my chest, legs, and feet. I can see my hair, too, because it's long. But I can just see the part of it that dangles. I got no idea what it looks like on my head. In that dungeon where they kept me, it used to fall out in clumps for no good reason at all. Are you new? The woman asks, because she knows she ain't ever seen me around here before. I shake my head. Her eyes go to my bare feet, which is bleeding. There's a thin stream of blood coming real quick. There's still blood on the knees of my pants, and I ain't bathed in weeks. My breath and my underarms is raunchy. I keep my arms down so the woman can't smell what I smell when I lift them up. The little girl is still saying hi. Are you hurt? The woman asks. She doesn't wait for me to tell her because she can see for herself that I am. I'm hurt bad all over. You are hurt, she says. You're bleeding, she says, pointing at my feet and then my knees. Right there, and there. How old are you? She asks. And when I don't answer right away, she starts rattling off numbers. Eleven? Twelve? Fourteen? A nod at fourteen, because I've got no idea how old I am. Fourteen is as good an age as any. It hurts to stand or walk because my feet on the underside is all torn up. My legs are sore, and my belly aches. The woman is still staring at me. She's got yellow hair like the sun. She smiles at me, but I can tell that it's not a real smile. It's a worried smile. The woman don't know what to make of me. Though soon she ain't looking at my face anymore, because she's looking at my hands and my arms and my knees and my feet. I like the sound of her voice. It's soft and kind. Are you lost, sweetheart? She asks me, her eyes coming back to mine. I say nothing. Do you live around here? The woman asks. I shrug my shoulders. I open my mouth to speak, but my voice is just barely there. I gotta stop and start over a time or two. I don't know, ma'am, I say. Because truth be told, I got no idea where I live, other than that the house is blue. But I couldn't find that blue house if my life depended on it. You don't need to call me ma'am, honey, she says. You can call me Annie. But of course I can't do that, because when I don't say ma'am, I either get a beaten or I get starved. You're really lost, aren't you? What happened here? She asks, meaning those scars on my arms. I just stare dumbly when she asks. I don't say nothing, but I feel tears pooling in my eyes. The woman asks, can I call your parents for you? Do you know their phone number? I shake my head. I don't know nothing about that. I can see the worry in her eyes. She looks me up and down. I feel uncomfortable with her looking at me like that. So I look at my hands instead. There's gravel buried into the palms of them. I pick at the tiny pebbles with my dirty fingernails so I don't have to look this pretty woman in the eyes. What's your name, sweetheart? 
Would you be willing to tell me that? She takes a breath when I say nothing. She says, you don't have to if you don't want to. I'm scared as heck, wondering what she wants to know my name for. But I tell her anyway, because I don't know what else to do, and because the woman seems kind. She don't seem like the kind of lady who would snatch kids that aren't hers and keep them in her basement. Delilah, I tell her, my voice rattling. I see in her throat that she swallows hard. There's a bulge that moves up and down. The little girl is tugging on her hand now, asking again and again, Who that? Who that, Mama? But the pretty woman don't answer her. Delilah what? The woman asks me. She got her eyes set on me now. She's not looking at my feet or my knees, but now she's looking at me. Her eyes have gone from wide to wider, and her skin is suddenly white-like. The dog's yapping up at her, trying to get her attention, but she pays it no mind. Delilah, Dickie, I say. The woman don't say nothing this time, but her hand goes to her mouth, and she gasps. Part two. Kate, 11 years before. May, there's a knock at the door. It's loud and insistent. It's after nine o'clock at night. It's dark outside, the moon and stars hidden behind storm clouds. The only time I can see outside is when lightning strikes, flooding the world with a sudden burst of light. I'm in the kitchen, home late from a long day of work. I've just opened a bottle of wine and am waiting for leftovers. These stuffed shells that she made hours ago, when I was still under the impression I'd be home on time, to warm in the microwave, when the knock comes. I look up from my glass at the sound of it, my blood running suddenly cold. People don't show up out of the blue at nine o'clock on a stormy night. B is out back in the detached garage that she uses as a music studio. Her phone lies on the counter beside my glass of wine. From the kitchen window, I look out into the backyard, where it's dark and raining. The rain pours down from the sky, a sudden blitz. I have trouble seeing out the window because of the rain. It hasn't stopped raining for days. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. I'm not the only one who's contemplated building an ark. Even B, the more even keeled of us, has contemplated building an ark. Severe flooding is expected, and every day of the next week calls for more rain. Rivers have overflowed their banks, wreaking havoc. The grocery store parking lot is a swimming pool. Roads are impassable, and some of the schools have been closed. There was footage on the news of canoes in towns not far from ours, paddling down the middle of the street. There's talk of the apocalypse, a quiet hysteria arising that maybe these rains are indicative of the end of times. I'm not some doomsday prophet, but still. I went to church and told the priest my confession just in case. You can never be too careful about these things. The wind has picked up in the last few hours. I turn on a light in the backyard, flicker it a few times. Outside, the branches of trees sway, scratching against the side and the back of our house. It's horrible to listen to, the stuff of nightmares, the rasp of tree limbs like claws against the wood siding, scraping to get in. Outside, trees lose their leaves in the storm, getting blown about. Power is out in parts of town, due to down blinds. Thankfully, we still have ours, though there's no telling how long that will last. We stocked up on candles, flashlight batteries, just in case. By now, they're impossible to find in stores. This morning, there were fallen trees in the street, casualties of last night's violent storm. In the middle of the night, the tornado sirens howled. 
Bee and I sat crouched in the first floor bathroom with Zeus in our arms, waiting for the storm to pass. Zeus hates to be held almost as much as he hates thunder. There are marks on my arms because of him. I continue to flicker the backyard light, but Bee doesn't notice because the door to the garage is closed. The only window is in the attic portion of the garage, where Bee doesn't go. It comes again then the same insistent battering on the heavy wood. My teeth clench, my shoulders tense. I tell myself that it's nothing to worry about. B is the more bold of us. If she were here, she'd answer the door unflinchingly. But without B, I force myself to be an adult, to go to the front door and open it up. Zeus is on the bottom step when I come into the hall. He runs upstairs at the sound of another knock to hide an incompetent guard cat. The front door is edged by windows. I turn the porch light on and have a look out the window before opening up the door. A man stands there in the glow of the porch light. He's dripping wet. At first, my heart starts. But then I breathe a sigh of relief when I see that it isn't some stranger showing up unsolicited at this time of night. My body physically relaxes at seeing him, the tension I was carrying in my shoulders melting away. Josh is our neighbor. He lives next door with his wife, Meredith, and their two kids. I pull open the door and the wind rushes in. The rain has drenched Josh and his son, Leo, who stands at Josh's side, shivering and wet. Both of their hair is limp, falling onto their faces. Water runs down their foreheads and cheeks. Their clothes hang heavy, shapeless. The rain can't reach them under the porch's wide roof. But that doesn't matter now that they're thoroughly soaked. They've walked here in the rain. It's not far, but they must have a good reason to be out on a night like tonight. Josh has his arm around Leo's shoulders, and he's pulling him into his leg. Leo's head barely surpassing Josh's knee in height. Leo isn't crying, but I can see on his face that he'd like to cry. Leo is four. We celebrated his birthday with Josh and Meredith last month at a circus-themed party in their backyard, where they hired a clown and a man who made animals out of balloons. People came in costume. Josh says hello. There's a half smile, but it's weighed down with something like worry. He's wearing his work clothes, though Josh invariably is home by dinner time. He keeps banker's hours when he isn't whining and dining clients, so that by now he should be relaxing in front of the TV in pajamas. What's going on? I ask, seeing that something is wrong. I pull the door open wide enough to let them both in, to get them out of the rain. But Josh, with a firm hand on Leo's shoulder, doesn't come. He looks to his house and then back at me. Have you heard from Meredith, Kate? He asks. Do you know where she is? Lightning flares behind Josh and Leo. The kind that stretches from the sky clear down to the ground. A second later, thunder booms. Leo leans in closer to Josh, clinging to his leg now. The rain pummels the porch roof, gathering in the gutter, running out the downspout and onto the lawn where it collects. I shake my head. No, I don't know. I haven't heard from her, I say, speaking loudly over the sound of the pelting rain. You can't find her? I ask. And my gut reaction isn't the same worry as Josh's. Meredith works odd hours. She's a doula, always disappearing in the middle of the night to help support some woman in labor. At a pinch, B or I, though mostly B who works from home, have watched Leo and his sister because Meredith needed to run to a berth and Josh wasn't home. It's not uncommon. Josh tells me that he can't find Meredith, and he hasn't heard from her. She must be at a berth, I say. Josh's reply is irresolute. He's of two minds about it, saying, Maybe. I don't know. But I don't think so. She would have called me if she was heading to a berth. She always calls. And then there's Delilah, he says, voice trailing. I ask him, 
Where's Delilah? Delilah is Josh and Meredith's daughter. She's six. Josh is shaking his head. The rainwater sprang off. I don't know, he says. I don't know where Delilah is either. There's a panic to his voice. He shouts over the rain. I ask him again to come inside, but he won't. His eyes swing back and forth from his house to me. And I know that he's watching for Meredith, waiting for her to come home. Josh goes back to the beginning. He fills me in on the details of the day. He was at work, he says. He took the train home and went to the babysitter's house to pick up Delilah and Leo, same as he always does. He took the 546 out of Chicago, which gets into town at 626. It was probably around 645 by the time I got to the sitter's house, he says. The sitter lives in the neighborhood, about a mile from here. B and I don't have kids, but I know where she lives. I know which house is hers. When I got there, he says. The sitter told me only Leo was there. She said that Meredith had kept Delilah home for the day because she was running a fever. She said Meredith had called Delilah in sick to school and had canceled her own classes. Meredith teaches at a yoga studio in town. She does it to supplement the income she makes as a doula. Not that she and Josh need it, because Josh does well enough for both of them. He works in wealth management, dealing with high net worth clients. But Meredith's schedule is irregular with peaks and valleys. Some weeks are overladen with births. Then she goes weeks without a single birth. She used to complain that she needed stability in her life, a sense of purpose during those times she had nothing to do. That's what drew her to yoga. You tried calling? I ask. Ten times at least. When is the last time you talked to her? He looks at me and runs his fingers through his dark hair. When we went to bed last night, he says. He tells me he saw her this morning. She was there lying in bed beside him, but she was asleep. He didn't want to wake her. He kissed her on the forehead before he left. His day was busy. It got away from him. He never had time to call or text Meredith. But to his defense, she also didn't call or text. That's not unusual, he says. That's the way it is with Meredith and me. Sometimes we're filling each other in on the minutiae of the day, other times we don't have time to check in. I didn't see Delilah today either, he says regretfully. I left for work before she was up. For the life of me, I can't remember if she looked run down last night. I've been racking my brain trying to remember. Josh is getting emotional now, worked up. He isn't crying, but I can see the weight of worry in his eyes and in the lines of his forehead. It isn't like Meredith not to call, not after all this time. I feel it in my gut then. Something is wrong. I'm not just thinking about Meredith and Delilah, because it would be one thing if this was an isolated incident, then maybe I wouldn't feel so concerned. But there's Shelby Tebow to consider. A young woman who went for a jog in our neighborhood 10 nights ago and never returned. What are you thinking, Josh? I ask, setting a hand on his arm. I wasn't worried when the sitter told me Delilah wasn't there. Not at first, he says. He thought it was weird that Meredith hadn't called to tell him about the fever, or at least tell him he didn't need to pick Delilah up. That seems like something Meredith would have done. But Delilah, he says, gets sick all the time. Kindergarten wreaks havoc on an immune system. They call her a germ magnet because of it. And maybe, he rationalized, Meredith Day had gotten away from her, and she hadn't had time to call because she was too busy taking care of Delilah. When I left the sitters, I was sure I was going to come home and find Meredith and Delilah there. So I didn't think much of it. Truthfully, Kate, he says, it didn't cross my mind that they wouldn't be home. I tried calling Meredith before I left the sitters, to ask if she needed me to pick anything up from the pharmacy. Medicine, juice, popsicles, he says, telling me how much Delilah craved red popsicles when she was running a fever. It was the only thing she'd eat. What happened? I ask. It went to voicemail, he says. He drove home. He pulled down the alley and opened the garage out back, finding it empty. 
though he knew he would, because the house was also dark. The sun hadn't yet set. But with the storm, it was dark enough outside to warrant turning a light on, especially since Delilah is afraid of the dark. That's when the worry set in for him. About two hours ago. He parked the car and ran inside to find the house empty. Only the dog was waiting for Leo and him. Food and water bowl both empty. Like he hadn't been fed since morning. Now I'm thinking the fever is way worse than the sitter made it out to be, he admits. It seems too late in the year for the flu. But what about meningitis? A burst appendix, sepsis? Or an ear infection, I offer. Thinking of a less frightening alternative to his. I squat down to Leo's height and ask in a soft voice. Hey, Leo. Can you tell me what Delilah was like today? Was she not feeling well? I ask. Do you remember if anything hurt? Leo just stares, gripping his wet security blanket in his hands, saying nothing. He's shy, but he's also four. Maybe too young to know or remember if Delilah was sick. The fever is concerning to me, but so too is what happened to Shelby Tebow, who still hasn't been found. There are also the weather conditions to consider. The thunder, the lightning, the threats of tornadoes. Add to that the fact that the current river levels are high. We've been under a flash flood warning for days. So long it feels like it will never lift. I've been hearing reports on the news that cars have been getting stuck in water on the streets. Flooded roads, the reporters keep saying, can be extremely dangerous. It only takes a couple feet of water to carry a car away. In the last few days, a month's worth of rain has come down. In the city, raw sewage is leaking into people's homes. It's awful. Suddenly, I hear movement in the hall behind me. I turn to see B making her way to us through the arched doorway that cuts between the kitchen and foyer. B is barefoot as always, the calves of her jeans wet from the rain. I thought I heard voices, she says, smiling down on me because B is tall. I haven't seen her since I left for work this morning. Today was long, nearly 12 hours spent on my feet. There were surgeries, a euthanasia. Then just as I was about to leave, a dog walked in with a rectal prolapse. I could have sent the owners to the after hours emergency clinic, but I didn't, prevailing instead on a couple vet techs to stay and help me push the tissue back in and suture it up, saving the owners hundreds of dollars. Those emergency clinics aren't cheap, and they didn't have the money for it. I doubted they would go. I imagined the dog in that condition all night, how uncomfortable he would have been. B was in her studio when I came home. I didn't want to disturb her. Most days, B and I are like ships that pass in the night. Because even tonight, long after B goes to bed, I'll be working on my records. Leave it for the morning, she always says, wanting me to go to bed with her. But if I leave it for the morning, I'll forget. A cold gust blows in from outside. It's late May. It should be much warmer than this but it's an El Nino year. The summer is expected to be cooler than normal and wet. So far, the weather forecasters have been right. B tugs the sleeves of her shirt down to the wrists. Her hand settles on my lower back. It's warm, a nice contrast to the cold air. She kisses me on the top of the head. I look at B. Josh can't find Meredith and Delilah, I say. You haven't heard from them today, have you? B thinks. Meredith came by this morning, she says. She looks at Josh. You were out of milk, she says. And he asks her what time that was. It was early, maybe eight o'clock. The kids wanted cereal for breakfast. Cinnamon Toast Crunch, wasn't it, Leo? She asks, smiling down on him. He smiles shyly back. Meredith left them at home and ran over to grab a cup. Did she say anything about Delilah being sick? He asks. B shakes her head. She came quickly. Just grabbed the milk and left. The kids were home alone. She didn't want to leave them more than a minute. She apologized for being a bother. I told her you two are never a bother. Delilah's sick? 
she asks, looking concerned. I fill B in on the details of the babysitter. I tell her about Delilah's fever. I'm so sorry, Josh. Meredith didn't say anything about it. I'm sure it's nothing. Could her cell phone be dead? She asks. Josh says, it is, but that still doesn't explain why they aren't home now. You found her phone? I ask, surprised. It isn't like Meredith to leave her phone behind. No, Josh says. We have that app, where we can track each other's phones. It was the first thing I checked. It says her location is unavailable, so her phone must be dead, I think. Or shut down. But Meredith's clients are so dependent on her, she wouldn't shut her phone down. Not on purpose. Josh looks at his watch to see what time it is. Delilah, he tells us, goes to bed by 7.30 most nights, eight latest. It's nearing 9.30 now. By now, Josh says. Both kids should be asleep, and Meredith and I should be catching up on TV. Josh tells us that in the last two hours, he called the pediatrician's office to see if Delilah had been there. But it was late. The office was closed. All he got was their answering service, who didn't have access to the schedule and wouldn't have told him even if they did. He called the hospital in town and a handful of convenient care clinics. But there are dozens of those. He doesn't know if he got them all. And even those he connected with weren't willing to give patient information over the phone. I go back to the possibility of a birth. If Meredith had a client in labor, would she have taken Delilah with her if she had no other choice? Childbirth can be fast and furious. Not that I would know. But on the nights that Josh, Meredith, B, and I shared a drink on the porch after their kids were asleep, Meredith regaled us with her most bizarre tales of birth. The women who refused to push, the fathers who threw shit fits when their sons turned out to be daughters. There were times Meredith missed or nearly missed births, when a laboring woman advanced from two centimeters to ten in the blink of an eye. Maybe this was one of those times. Meredith didn't have time to call Josh or to leave Delilah with B. She had to go. Still, Josh asks. If the birth was fast, wouldn't she be home by now? B looks at Leo standing there in the glow of the porch light. He looks so small. Every time lightning strikes or thunder booms, he shudders, clinging tighter to Josh's leg. But Josh is so concerned about Meredith and Delilah, he doesn't notice. B says to him, hey, buddy, I made cookies. You like chocolate chip? And he nods a hesitant yes. They're in the kitchen, on the counter. You go help yourself, okay? You know the way. Leo looks to Josh for approval. Josh forces a smile. Go on, he says. Just take your shoes off. Stepping timidly inside our home, Leo does as told before scampering off in wet socks for a cookie, his blue blanket trailing behind. With Leo gone, B asks Josh, did you call the police? Josh shakes his head. There's something frantic about it. His eyes are wild. Josh, she asks. Did Meredith have a reason to leave? B doesn't mince words. It's not her way. She gets right to the point, asking, were you guys fighting? His reply is resolute. We weren't fighting, he says. Not like you might think. But Meredith wasn't herself lately. She was stressed out all the time. She was quiet. I wanted to know why. She wouldn't tell me. All she'd say is that it was nothing, that she was fine. How long had this been going on? I ask. I don't know, he says. Maybe two weeks. It's been about two weeks since I last saw Meredith. I remember that night, B's 30th birthday. I don't remember Meredith being particularly quiet or stressed. That said, we all put on a good face when we need to. It's not like Meredith to keep secrets from you. I say, Josh and Meredith have a marriage others would envy. By their own account, they've always tried to be honest with each other. They made a promise before they got married to never go to bed angry. 
It's the kind of promise most couples make and then easily break. But not Josh and Meredith. That said, I overheard the occasional snarky remark from time to time. Sometimes, in summer, with windows open, the sound of angry, arguing voices carried from their house to ours. But that's a marriage. They're not all happy all the time. B and I argue, too. Meredith came from a broken family, you know, Josh says. I did, too. We wanted ours to be different. But I could tell something had her down lately. Like what? I ask. I don't know, he says. I thought maybe she was seeing someone else. Maybe she was falling out of love with me. His eyes move from B to me and back again. He's looking for one of us to either substantiate or disprove his theory. I can't honestly do either because I don't know. Neither can be. We know Josh and Meredith well enough, but not enough to know if she was being unfaithful. We're not that kind of friends, and we're just as close to Josh as we are to Meredith. We don't have a loyalty to one over the other. If Meredith was cheating, it isn't the kind of thing she'd tell us. That's unlikely, I say. I say it to appease him. But the truth is, I never had any reason to believe Meredith wasn't madly in love with Josh. Even if that's the case, and worst case scenario, Meredith is leaving you. Why would she take Delilah and leave Leo behind? B asks. She wouldn't do that, Josh. She adores those kids. Both of them. You know that. Josh shakes his head. He's at a loss. He asks. You think I should call the police? Or is it too premature for that? Maybe I should give it the night and see if she comes home on her own. I don't want to blow this out of proportion. B tells him. If you're worried, Josh, I don't think a call to the police would hurt. I echo B's sentiment. Between the fever, the weather, Meredith not answering her phone, there's plenty of cause for concern. The sudden scourge of missing women also has me worried. I can't get Shelby off my mind. We convince Josh to come inside. With one last glance at his own home, he grudgingly does. He sits down on our sofa, and while B disappears into the kitchen to keep Leo company, Josh calls the police and reports his wife and daughter missing. Meredith, 11 years before. March. The text comes from a number I don't know. It's a 630 area code, local. I'm in the bathroom with Leo as he soaks in the tub. He has his bath toys lined up on the edge of it, and they're taking turns swan diving into the now lukewarm water. It used to be hot, too hot for Leo to get into. But he's been in there for 30 minutes now, playing with his octopus, his whale, his fish. He's having a ball. Meanwhile, I've lost track of time. I have a client in the early stages of labor. We're texting. Her husband wants to take her to the hospital. She thinks it's too soon. Her contractions are six and a half minutes apart. She's absolutely correct. It's too soon. The hospital would just send her home, which is frustrating, not to mention a huge inconvenience for women in labor. And anyway, why labor at the hospital when you can labor in the comfort of your own home? First-time fathers always get skittish. It does their wives no good. By the time I get to them, more times than not, the woman in labor is the more calm of the two. I have to focus my attention on pacifying a nervous husband. It's not what they're paying me for. I tell Leo one more minute until I shampoo his hair and then fire off a quick text, suggesting my client have a snack to keep her energy up, herself nourished. I recommend a nap, if her body will let her. The night ahead will be long for all of us. Childbirth, especially when it comes to first-time moms, is a marathon, not a sprint. Josh is home. He's in the kitchen cleaning up from dinner while Delilah plays. 
Delilah's do up next in the tub. By the time I leave, the bedtime ritual will be done, or nearly done. I feel good about that, hating the times I leave Josh alone with so much to do. I draw up my text and then hit send. The reply is immediate, that all too familiar ping that comes to me at all hours of the day or night. I glance down at the phone in my hand, expecting it's my client with some conditioned reply. Thanks. Instead, I know what you did. I hope you die. Beside the text is a picture of a grayish skull with large black eye sockets and teeth. The symbol of death. My muscles tense. My heart quickens. I feel thrown off. The small bathroom feels suddenly, overwhelmingly oppressive. It's steamy, moist, hot. I drop down to the toilet and have a seat on the lid. My pulse is loud, audible in my own ears. I stare at the words before me, wondering if I've misread. Certainly I've misread. Leo is asking, is it a minute, mommy? I hear his little voice, muffled by the ringing in my ears. But I'm so thrown by the cutthroat text that I can't speak. I glance at the phone again. I haven't misread. The text is not from my client in labor. It's not from any client of mine whose name and number is stored in my phone. As far as I can tell, it's not from anyone I know. A wrong number then, I think. Someone sent this to me by accident. It has to be. My first thought is to delete it, to pretend this never happened, to make it disappear, out of sight, out of mind. But then I think of whoever sent it just sending it again or sending something worse. I can't imagine anything worse. I decide to reply. I'm careful to keep it to the point to not sound too judgy or fault-finding, because maybe the intended recipient really did do something awful, stole money from a children's cancer charity, and the text isn't as egregious as it looks at first glance. I text, you have the wrong number. The response is quick. I hope you rot in hell, Meredith. The phone slips from my hand. I yelp. The phone lands on the navy blue bath mat, which absorbs the sound of its fall. Meredith. Whoever is sending these texts knows my name. The texts are meant for me. A second later, Josh knocks on the bathroom door. I spring from the toilet seat and stretch down for the phone. The phone has fallen face down. I turn it over. The text is still there on the screen, staring back at me. Josh doesn't wait to be let in. He opens the door and steps right inside. I slide the phone into the back pocket of my jeans before Josh has a chance to see. Hey, he says, how about you save some water for the fish? Leo complains to Josh that he is cold. Well, let's get you out of the bath, Josh says, stretching down to help him out of the water. I need to wash him still, I admit. Before me, Leo's teeth chatter. There are goosebumps on his arm that I hadn't noticed before. He is cold, and I feel suddenly guilty, though it's mired in confusion and fear. I hadn't been paying any attention to Leo, there is bath water spilled all over the floor, but his hair is still bone dry. You haven't washed him? Josh asks. And I know what he's thinking. That in the time it took him to clear the kitchen table, wash pots and pans, and wipe down the sinks, I did nothing. He isn't angry or accusatory about it. Josh isn't the type to get angry. I have a client in labor. I say by means of explanation. She keeps texting, I say, telling Josh that I was just about to wash Leo. I drop to my knees beside the tub. 
I reach for the shampoo. In the back pocket of my jeans, the phone again pings. This time, I ignore it. I don't want Josh to know what's happening. Not until I get a handle on it for myself. Josh asks, aren't you going to get that? I say that it can wait. I focus on Leo, on scrubbing the shampoo onto his hair. But I'm anxious. I move too fast so that the shampoo suds get in his eye. I see it happening, but all I can think to do is wipe it from his forehead with my own soapy hands. It doesn't help. It makes it worse. Leo complains. Leo isn't much of a complainer. He's an easygoing kid. Ow, is all that he says, his tiny wet hands going to his eyes. Though shampoo in the eye burns like hell. Does that sting, baby? I ask, feeling contrite. But I'm bursting with nervous energy. There's only one thought racing through my mind. I hope you rot in hell, Meredith. Who would have sent that and why? Whoever it is knows me. They know my name. They're mad at me for something I've done. Mad enough to wish me dead. I don't know anyone like that. I can't think of anything I've done to upset someone enough that they'd want me dead. I grab the wet washcloth draped over the edge of the tub. I try handing it to Leo so that he can press it to his own eyes. But my hands shake as I do. I wind up dropping the washcloth into the bath. The tepid water rises up and splashes him in the eyes. This time he cries. Oh, buddy, I say. I'm so sorry. It slipped. But as I try again to grab it from the water and hand it to him, I drop the washcloth for a second time. I leave it where it is letting Leo fish it out of the water and wipe his eyes for himself. Meanwhile, Josh stands two feet behind, watching. My phone pings again. Josh says, someone is really dying to talk to you. Dying. It's all that I hear. My back is to Josh, thank God. He can't see the look on my face when he says it. What's that? I ask. Your client, Josh says. I turn to him. He motions to my phone jutting out of my back pocket. She really needs you. You should take it, Mayor, he says softly, accommodatingly. And only then do I think about my client in labor and feel guilty. What if it is her? What if her contractions are coming more quickly now and she does need me? Josh says, I can finish up with Leo while you get ready to go. And I acquiesce, because I need to get out of here. I need to know if the texts coming to my phone are from my client, or if they're coming from someone else. I rise up from the floor. I scoot past Josh in the door, brushing against him. His hand closes around my upper arm as I do, and he draws me in for a hug. Everything okay? He asks. And I say, yes, fine, sounding too chipper even to my own ears. Everything is not okay. I'm just thinking about my client, I say. She's had a stillbirth before, at 32 weeks. She never thought she'd get this far. Can you imagine that? Losing a baby at 32 weeks? Josh says no. His eyes move to Leo, and he looks saddened by it. I feel guilty for the lie. It's not this client, but another who lost a baby at 32 weeks. When she told me about it, I was completely torn up. It took everything in me not to cry, as she described for me the moment the doctor told her her baby didn't have a heartbeat. Labor was later induced, and she had to push her dead baby out with only her mother by her side. Her husband was deployed at the time. After she was snowed under by guilt, 
Was it her fault the baby died? A thousand times I held her hand and told her no. I'm not sure she ever believed me. My lie has the desired effect. Josh stands down and asks if I need help with anything before I leave. I say no, that I'm just going to change my clothes and go. I step out of the bathroom. In the bedroom, I close the door. I grab my scrub bottoms and a long-sleeved t-shirt from my drawer. I lay them on the bed. But before I get dressed, I pull my phone out of my pocket. I take a deep breath and hold it in, summoning the courage to look. I wonder what waits there. More nasty threats? My heart hammers inside me. My knees shake. I take a look. There are two messages waiting for me. The first, water broke, contractions five men apart. And then, heading to hospital, M. I release my pent up breath. The texts are from my client's husband, sent from her phone. My legs nearly give in relief, and I drop down to the edge of the bed, forcing myself to breathe. I inhale long and deep. I hold it in until my lungs become uncomfortable. When I breathe out, I try and force away the tension. But I can't sit long because my client is advancing quickly. I need to go. Leo. Now. To be straight, I never thought they were going to find you. I gave that up a long time ago. In all honesty, I kind of wish they hadn't, because Dad and I were getting along just fine without you. It took him long enough to get over you in the first place. Now you've gone and reopened the wound, made him mourn for Mom all over again, as if she's only just died. The truth is, Dad was never much of a dad to me until he got over missing you. But now, you're back, and in his eyes, you're all that matters. That's not to say I didn't think about you. I thought about you a lot when you were gone, though all I ever knew was the absence of you. I knew I was supposed to have a big sister, but didn't. I knew that, compared to you, I was second tier. There's a room in our house that's yours. I don't ever remember anyone living in there. It's pink, that's all I know, because I'm not supposed to go in there and mess it up. It's off limits. Dad pretends it's something sacred and holy, but all it is is an old dusty room. At school, they treat me like some special needs kid because of you. Everyone's supposed to be nice to me because I'm the kid whose mom is dead and whose sister is gone. The truth is, nobody's nice to me. They treat me like a freak instead. I don't remember having a sister. I can't be sad about it. When you were gone, I tried to remember. I wanted to remember. But turns out, kid memories are weird. I spent probably too much time trying to learn about implicit and explicit memories. Like why I can't remember us playing together when we were little. Or mom singing me to sleep. But the smell of bacon always comes as a punch to the gut. And I don't know why. Dad tells me you used to push me on the swing in our backyard. We still have that swing. It's no ordinary swing, but is instead a scrap of wood with two thick strings that hangs from a tree. You probably don't remember this, but when I was three and you were five, you pushed me so hard I fell face first off the swing. I don't remember it either. But Dad's told that story so many times, it's like I do. It's like I can convince myself that I remember what it felt like when I let go of the strings fell forward, and face-planted to the ground. It left me with a scar over my eye. The scar I've still got, but the memory of it is gone. They're not false memories because they really happened. They're just false to me. There's a difference. I don't know why I'm telling you this. You probably don't care. When you were gone and I wanted to feel close to you, I googled your name. You're all over the internet, you know. 
a recap, mostly, of the last few days before you went missing. Details about the search and what happened to mom. Potential sightings that never panned out. Like the lady who said she saw you at some IHOP in Jacksonville, right across the street from the used car dealer where she worked. Dad booked a flight that very night, left me behind, and went to Florida where he searched for you for days. You never turned up. Not a year later, some man said he spotted you at a Safeway in Redwood City, California. And after that, a truck driver swore he saw you at world's largest truck stop. Dad went to those places too. But every time, he came back empty-handed and sad. There's a reward for your return, you know. There's nothing people won't do for money. Even lie. Online, there are the conspiracy theories, too. My favorite is the newspaper article from the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, 2015, where people swear some girl in the background of a black and white photo is you. That photo is all over the internet now. That girl, whoever she is, is famous, or infamous, or whatever. The cops were never able to identify her. And yet, there are whole sites devoted to that picture, like Find Delilah, which some obsessed nobody started up in the hopes of finding you and earning that reward. Ten grand, the reward is up to now. That woman who found you hit the jackpot. But for as much as people think the internet knows everything, the one thing it doesn't say is that the girl who came back isn't the same one who disappeared. Kate. Eleven years before. May. B is in bed when the police finally come. It takes over an hour. With weather conditions as they are, emergencies abound. The police and paramedics have been kept busy lately, rescuing people from flooded roads and homes. The officers arrive without lights and sirens. They slip nearly invisibly down the darkened street, pulling to the curb and parking in front of Josh and Meredith's house. When he called to report Meredith and Delilah missing, Josh was told that an officer was on his way. And so he'd left B and me and carried Leo home to get him to bed before they came. When will mommy be home? Leo had asked as they left, chocolate on his fingers and lips, woozy with fatigue. I open the front door and step out onto the covered porch with a throw blanket wrapped around me, my feet bare. I leave the porch light off, feeling invisible in the darkness, though I stay alert. It's hard not to be scared after all that's happened. I have to wonder if some monster is stalking women in the neighborhood, or if what's happened to Shelby and Meredith are two isolated incidents. I back myself into the corner on the porch, where nothing can come at me from behind. The wooden porch is damp on my feet. It's still raining, but the rain is slower now, the night more tame. It's quieted down to a peaceful drizzle. I stand in the darkness, staring through the trees that disrupt my view of the street. I watch as two officers make their way to Josh and Meredith's house, where Josh pulls the front door open before they have a chance to knock and wake up Leo. I hear their voices one male and one female. They introduce themselves. Josh says hello and tells them his name. He invites them inside. The officers step in and he closes the door. The blinds are open in their house, so I can see Josh and the officers, but I can't hear what they say. There's a chill to the night air, and soon I'm cold. I wait outside a while, until five minutes turns into fifteen, and I step back in, watching through a window until, 40 minutes later, they finally leave. I wait in vain for Josh to call or text with news. I think about calling him, but don't want to overstep. I try and work on my records, but my mind is too agitated to focus. All I can think about is Meredith and Delilah. It's after 11 o'clock, and they still aren't home. After this many hours missing and this late at night, it's hard to believe something innocuous has happened. My mind gets flooded with images of Meredith's car submerged in the river, or Meredith and Delilah taken along with Shelby. The thought terrifies me, and I force back tears, telling myself no, 
that whatever happened to Shelby is far different than what's happened to Meredith and Delilah. It was ten days ago that B and I first woke to the news. We hadn't known Shelby, but it was all over Facebook. And then later in the day, in the paper and on the news. Local woman missing. B and I watched as police cruisers surveilled the neighborhood, as police dogs went in and out of the Tebow home to pick up and track Shelby's scent. The police came around asking questions. Until I saw her face on the news, I didn't know what Shelby looked like. I'd never heard of her before. Ours is a large suburb, with a population that tops 100,000. You can't know everyone. According to her husband, Shelby had gone for a run that night. From what we read, it was after 10 when she left. It was dark outside. B and I both thought the same thing. That was too late for a woman to be out running alone. But according to her husband, they had a new baby at home. Shelby stayed home with the baby. Her husband worked long hours. When he came home that night, they had a late dinner together, and then she hung around until the next time the baby needed to be fed. This wasn't the first time she'd gone running late at night, because some days it was the only time she had to herself. Needless to say, she never came home. Shelby's husband, Jason Tebow, was the first to come under suspicion. The first and the only, as far as we know. He's still a suspect. Secrets were quickly smoked out by reporters and the police and became common knowledge. Friends of Jason's reported that Shelby had a flair for the melodramatic. They said she was a liar and a con. There was plenty of gossip all over the social media sites. The police department posted the details of Shelby's disappearance to their Facebook page. The comments were ruthless. That girl wouldn't know the truth if it hit her in the face, someone said. Shelby's side fired back. They accused Jason's friends of slander. Shelby, they said, was none of these things. She's kind, loving. She always put others first. They said instead that Jason had been unfaithful since the baby was born, and probably before. Fatherhood was apparently not his cup of tea, and neither was monogamy. It was easy to assume he'd done something to her. But now, in light of Meredith and Delilah's disappearance, a thought sows fear into my mind. What if it wasn't domestic violence? What if there's a serial kidnapper on the loose? Meredith. Eleven years before. March. The hospital parking garage is empty when I leave. It's 3.30 in the morning. I was with my client for nearly seven hours, helping her deliver a beautiful baby boy that she and her husband named Zeppelin. It's horrible. He's only hours old, and already I'm imagining him being made fun of at school. But no one asked for my opinion. The husband, Matt, is an amateur guitar player and a diehard fan of 70s rock. They'd made up their minds weeks ago. All night, my phone was quiet. The only person to text was Josh, who said goodnight before he went to bed and told me he loved me. He doesn't ever ask how things are progressing or what time I'll be home. He knows better than to ask. He knows I don't know. Childbirth is rarely predictable. This delivery was relatively quick, as firstborns go. My focus was on my client and her baby. It was a welcome reprieve. I didn't have time to think about anything else, like those awful texts. But now, as I step onto the fourth floor of the parking garage, they come rushing back to me. I spot my car on the other side of the garage. I move quickly, a speed walk, just shy of a run. There are only a handful of cars here. Visiting hours ended eons ago. The cars still here belong to patients and hospital staff. Everything about the parking garage is cliche. It's poorly lit, dirty, and claustrophobic. There's a foul smell to it because the garage walls are solid with little ventilation. Even without the texts, the garage sparks fear. 
It belongs in a movie scene. It always scares me, but tonight, especially so. I reach into my bag. I carry pepper spray with me because long ago, Josh made me. He's always hated the idea of me out on the street or in abandoned parking garages late at night. I told him he was being ridiculous. I swore nothing bad was going to happen to me. But now I'm grateful for the pepper spray. I've had the same canister for years. It's probably expired. The ingredients degraded so that they wouldn't be much help if I needed them. But the weight of it in my hand is a relief. It's better than nothing. I keep my head up as I walk. I stay alert, scanning the parking garage with every step. There's no one here. The parking garage is empty. Still, there are darkened voids where I can't see, like in the corners of the garage where the lights don't reach. There are stairwells at each corner. The doors are open. Only a blackened hollow remains. If someone was there, standing in that blackened hollow, three feet back from the open door, I wouldn't know. I also wouldn't know if someone was behind me. I try to listen for footsteps, but there is some sort of supply or exhaust fan whirring in the garage. It dampens all other sounds. All I can hear is that fan. Twice, I glance back to see if someone's there, and no one is. Still, it doesn't fully suppress the fear. As soon as I turn back, the fear of being followed returns. I dig again into my bag. I find my cell phone, grip it in my hand. I don't want to call and wake Josh. I'd never hear the end of it. If he knew I was scared, he'd want to send a whole brigade with me to every berth I went to make sure I was safe. I consider a call to Kate or Cassandra or B. It would be a great comfort to have someone on the other end of the line keeping me company. But it's 3.30 in the morning. I can't call and wake someone up. I hasten my pace. By the time I'm halfway across the garage, I've broken into a run. I'm sweating, my breath coming so fast that I have trouble catching it. My pulse pounds in my ears. I reach the car. I yank open the door and nearly dive into the driver's seat. I slam the door closed. I tap the button and activate the locks. But that's only a partial relief because there's still the fear that when I look in my rearview mirror, someone will be there. My fears aren't unfounded because of the text messages. I hope you die. I hope you rot in hell. I have every reason to be scared, though I've tried my best to convince myself that the texts are only a prank, that someone with a sick sense of humor is sending them, though I don't know anyone like that. I thrust my keys into the ignition. I start the car. Before I can throw it into reverse, there's a tap on my window. I scream, seeing only blackness filling the glass. Someone is standing beside the car. I can't make out a face. I grab for the pepper spray. The only other things I have to use are an ice scraper and my keys. The figure squats down, and there in the window is Jeanette, the midwife. I throw my hand to my heart. Oh, God, I say, lowering the window and forcing myself to smile, to relax. You scared the shit out of me, Jeanette. I take a deep breath. Jeanette is here in the parking garage with me. No one will hurt me while Jeanette is here. Sorry, she replies, still on a high from the birth. They can be vitalizing sometimes, especially the ones like this that don't take 24 hours only to wind up in surgery. I thought you saw me, Jeanette says. I've been trailing you for a while. I called out for you. I tell her, I didn't hear you or I would have stopped. Then she gets a mischievous grin on her face and says to me, Zeppelin.
and we both laugh. The kids will have a field day with that. I feel sorry for the poor boy, I say. He'll grow up hating his parents for it. Whatever happened to Thomas and James? Jeanette asks. Jeanette is older than me. She's more traditional. Come on, Jeanette, I say. Don't you know that Thomas and James have fallen out of rotation in recent years? These days, it's all Jacobs and Noahs and Masons. And apparently, Zeppelins. It's an atrocity, I say. We have a good laugh. It's getting late, Jeanette says. In just a few hours, the sun will rise. You better get home and try and sleep before your own babies are up. We say our goodbyes. I watch as Jeanette makes her way to her car parked farther down. Once she's safely in, I spin out of the parking garage, going fast. The relief washes over me when my car finally reaches the street outside. On the street, there are other cars. Building lights, street lights. It's still hours away from dawn, but the moon is nearly full giving off additional light. A 24-hour McDonald's calls for me. And though I'm usually not a fan of fast food, I consider a run through the drive through because it's been hours since I've had a thing to eat. I'm famished, craving something greasy and quick. The relief is short-lived because soon after comes the familiar ping of my phone. A text message. It could be Josh, wanting an update. Now that Tuesday has become Wednesday, childcare arrangements may need to be made. He leaves for work early, by six o'clock. He'll need to find something to do with the kids if I'm not home by then. Though I will be, he just doesn't know it yet. He's being proactive. I grab my phone from the passenger's seat to see what he's said. But the text message isn't from Josh. It comes from the same unfamiliar number as the rest. Get home safe, it says. Leo. Now. Dad took home videos of us when we were kids. Hours of them. Some nights, when he's being especially pathetic, he makes me watch. The girl in those videos is giddy, silly. She smiles a lot. She's always giggling. You, on the other hand, are dead serious. You look shook, scared. You're nothing like that girl anymore. You're someone new. I'm at school when dad gets the call from the police. He comes to get me. It's fourth period honors algebra when he comes, which most people hate, but I like because it comes easy to me. Apparently, I'm good at math. Not that you care. The whole stupid class gets fired up when they call me down over the intercom because they think I'm in trouble. The truth? No one likes me. I'm the weird kid, the freak, the loser. I have you to thank for that. I don't get in trouble, though. The only time I get in trouble is when the other kids tell lies about me. Dad's waiting in the office when I come down. His eyes are red and watery like he's been crying, which is embarrassing as fuck when kids at school see your dad cry. Todd Felding walks by and sees, and I know I'm never going to live this one down. Dad and I leave, and together we go get you. They've got you in a room at the police station, and it's just you and the lady cop. She has a name. It's Detective Rollings. I just don't like calling her that. Dad calls her that sometimes, but mostly, he calls her Carmen. I'm not entirely sure, but if I had to guess, I'd say Dad and the lady cop have hooked up before. She's been there from the beginning, and is, as Dad says, invested. Dad's so blind that he can't see she's got the hots for him. He thinks it's all about solving a cold case. Instead. It's about trying to get into his pants, which I'm sure she has more than once. 
Dad doesn't know it, but I've read the texts the lady cop sends him. They're mushy, sloppy, sentimental. They make me want to vomit. She massages Dad's ego, tells him she admires how brave he is, how gentle, how honest. I've been thinking about you, she sometimes texts. You and Leo are on my mind all the time. Gag. They've got a plate of food for you. You're eating, except that it's like you forgot how to eat, because you're doing it all wrong. You're thin. You've got pale skin. Your hands shake. Dad is so sure you're you that he rushes right up to you and gives you a hug. You go stiff. It looks to me like you stop breathing. You try to pull back, but Dad won't let you. He's crying. He's holding on for dear life. The lady cop has to lay a hand on his arm and tell Dad to give you some room. I'm embarrassed for him. I feel my own cheeks get hot because of the way he acts. You look just like your mom, he says, cupping your face in his hand. And from the pictures I've seen, you do. You both have red hair, which is something, because only about 2% of people have red hair. I hang back by the door. I don't know you. Dad and the lady cop talk a long time. They stand too close. A DNA test is pending, but that doesn't matter because Dad already knows it's you. The lady cop suggests you get checked out by a doctor. She wants to check for evidence that you've been sexually abused. Dad looks like he might be sick when she says those words. Sexually abused. Like a rape kit, Dad asks. I've heard of that before. The lady cop says yes. She touches his hand, her voice going soft. It's precautionary, Josh. We don't know for sure that she's been sexually abused. But if we can find the person who did this to her, it will help convict him. She says there might be DNA evidence on you that will aid in their investigation. I don't like that she calls Dad Josh. I also don't like that she touches his hand when she says it. Dad's torn. He wants to help the police, but he doesn't want to traumatize you. The line between these things is thin. Eventually, Dad says yes, and we go to the hospital, where we sit in the lobby and wait. You go into the exam room with the nurse alone. Dad offers to go with you, to hold your hand, which is weird as fuck. The lady cop tells him no. She says it gentler than that. I don't think that would be a good idea, Josh. You're not six years old anymore, but try telling that to Dad. The lady cop sits with us during the whole entire exam. You shouldn't be alone, she says to Dad, though he isn't alone. He has me. I wish that she would leave. It takes so long, I think it will never be done. They confiscate your clothes. They send you home with something else to wear. There's never any question of if you are who you say you are, though the DNA results won't be back for another day. Child services could take you for the night. Child services is supposed to take you for the night. But after all that you've been through, the lady cop breaks the rules and lets dad and me take you home. She tells dad what you told them about where you've been. Dad nearly goes through the roof. It doesn't make sense, he says. And he's right, seeing as how mom was found dead of a self-inflicted knife wound with a note. You'll never find her. Don't even try. The note went on to say that you were safe, that you were fine. If what you say is true, you weren't fine. You were far from fine. But maybe you're lying. No one thinks about that but me. We leave with promises to take you to a shrink and to our own doctor for a follow-up. They're worried about malnutrition, muscle atrophy, physical abuse, they're worried about your eyes. You have to wear special sunglasses because you haven't seen daylight in 11 years. At home, we're supposed to keep the blinds closed. They're worried about your feet. They're wrapped in bandages. If you had shoes, they took those too. They're also worried about your mental state. It's clear to see you're not all there. You're not right in the head. 
You're scared as heck, wasted and emaciated. You should be 17, but no one would ever think you're 17. You could pass for 10. You've got no boobs. You're about four and a half feet tall. You weigh maybe 80 pounds. We drive home. You ride in the back seat. You say nothing. It's a media circus when we get home. That's what dad says as he steers the car through a crowd of reporters. A media circus. It makes me think of the reporters as clowns, as circus freaks, which they are. They step back so dad doesn't run them over. Still, they take pictures through the car window. They shout questions at you. Those farther back crane their necks for a measly look at you. There are a buttload of them. They fight each other for a square foot of our lawn, which dad says they aren't supposed to be on anyway because that's trespassing. He lays on the horn and they step farther back from the car. At the sound of dad's horn, you spaz out, getting all twitchy. I feel sorry for you, but I don't know what to say to make it better. So I say nothing. I ask dad how they know you're here. Dad says some shyster at the station or the hospital probably leaked to the media that you were back. Otherwise, how would they know? Your miraculous return is supposed to be kept on the down low. Dad's angry about it because if what you told the lady cop is true, then there's still someone out there looking for you. And if that's the case, these reporters will lead them right to our door. Meredith. Eleven years before. March. Dawn comes quickly. The morning after a birth is never easy. I wake to Josh leaning over me, kissing me before he leaves. What time is it? I ask, bleary-eyed. I try to shade my eyes from the morning sun that streams in through the break in the curtains. Six, he says. There's coffee on the table beside you. What time did you get home? Around four. When I got home, it took me a while to fall asleep. I was scared, wondering if the same person who texted me had also followed me home. I thought about waking Josh and telling him what happened, but I didn't want to worry him unnecessarily. Josh already worries. He said it before, how he doesn't like me driving home alone in the middle of the night after a birth. Many, if not all, of the hospitals I visit have sketchy parking garages. Some of the hospitals are in the city, in rougher neighborhoods that I have to walk through to get to my car. There aren't many people on the street after nightfall. I've always been dismissive of his concerns. If anything, I've agreed to the pepper spray, to downloading some app on my phone that tracks my whereabouts all of the time. Josh feels better because of it. This way, he said, when he convinced me to download the app and accept his friend invite. If you go missing, I can find you. He said it in jest, and we both laughed at the time. But now it's not funny. It works both ways. I can keep tabs on Josh, too though I never have. Josh has suggested before that I shut down my private doula practice and teach yoga full time. He likes that yoga classes are held during business hours, that the hours are predictable, that the clientele is primarily female. I don't tell Josh about what happened last night because he'd want to reopen this discussion. That's not an argument I want to have. I love the practice of yoga, but teaching yoga can be repetitive, mundane. I couldn't do that for the rest of my life. I love what I do. I love the miracle of birth. What did they have? Josh asks. And I tell him a boy. Zeppelin, I say. He pulls a face. As in the blimp? He asks. I laugh. As in the band, I say, not sure it makes it any better. Do you want me to wake the kids? Josh asks. 
But there's no need because I hear them down the hall, their feet hobbling toward our room. They appear in the doorway, all bedhead and out of joint. Delilah clutches her doll, Leo his beloved blue blankie. He never goes anywhere without that thing. He hangs on Delilah's arm, and already at six in the morning, she's whining at him to stop touching her. Leo deifies Delilah. He can't get enough of her. All he wants is to be with her, in any capacity. He'll play hours of school, of house. Delilah, on the other hand, wishes he was a girl. A big sister, preferably. Come on, guys. Josh says as he stands before the floor mirror, tying a half Windsor knot into his houndstooth tie. Josh always wears a tie to work. He's always well-groomed. He wants to look good for his clients because looking good fosters confidence and respect. I get that. I stare at his reflection in the mirror. My husband is incredibly handsome. How did I get so lucky? I often wonder. The kids jump into bed with me. Before Josh leaves, he tells them to be good for mommy. Delilah finds the remote and turns the TV on. Together, we sit quietly in bed watching bubble guppies. Delilah lays her head on my lap and Leo snuggles in closely beside me. I wrap my arm around him, wishing we could stay like this all day. Ever since Delilah started kindergarten, our days go by exceptionally fast. I miss the long, lazy days we used to have when they were younger. But before nine o'clock comes, Delilah will be in school, Leo at the sitters, and me at work. I reach for the coffee Josh has left me and take a sip. An hour of sleep is never enough. The exhaustion wears me down makes me feel physically ill. My phone is on the table beside me, volume turned up because it has to be. I never have the luxury of powering it down at night because a client might need me. I reach for it in the hopes that I somehow misunderstood the text messages from yesterday. I take a look, ever hopeful. Yet there they are, just the same as they were last night. Instantly evoking fear. I hope you rot in hell, Meredith. Kate. Eleven years before. May. The next morning when I wake up, B is already gone. It was nearly one o'clock by the time I went to bed. I only got five hours of sleep, and even that was intermittent at best. I kept thinking of Meredith and Delilah, hoping that by morning there'd be good news, hoping that by morning they'd be found. Now I take the servant's stairs down to the kitchen and find that Bee is in her studio, working again because the back door is open. There are two staircases in our house, one in the front and this one, which is narrow, curved and tucked away in back, a passageway from the second floor to the kitchen dating back to times when servants weren't meant to be seen. It's one of the reasons I first fell in love with the old home, for its history. Bee must have taken her own breakfast out to the studio to eat while she works. She's left me a plate. The cool, humid morning air comes in through the open door. Bee had the detached garage converted into a music studio when she moved in with me. It's a charming place, though one I rarely go inside because it's Bee's workplace, much in the same way that she doesn't ever show up at my office. Boundaries are important in a relationship. Bee writes her own music in the garage. She records it. I know I shouldn't, but still I try and listen in sometimes, because Bee has a sexy voice. It's husky and rich and thick. You'd think she smoked a pack a day by the sound of her voice, but she doesn't but unless she leaves the door open by mistake, I can't hear inside. I met B six years ago at a bar in the city where she was performing. It was the summer before vet school. I was working as a cocktail waitress to earn extra cash for school. 
we fell in love. Two months later, I left for school. We kept in touch. B came to visit me. After graduation, I came back, got a job, bought a house. When B moved in with me, she didn't want to piss the neighbors off with her music. It's the reason we had the garage converted, making it soundproof. She figured the neighbors would already be pissed off enough with two gay women living on the street. The idea of a house in suburbia made B's skin crawl. She wasn't that type. But she did it for me. The house was close and convenient to my work. B could work anywhere. The house is a yellow 1904 Italianate in our town's historic district. It sits just a stone's throw away from a college campus, in an area more liberal than conservative. It's romantic, with brick walkways and hundred-year-old trees. But that doesn't mean there isn't the occasional hatred and bigotry, because no matter where you go, you can't get away from that. B no longer performs in bars. These days, the only time I hear her sing is in the shower. For someone who loves to perform for a crowd, she's strictly against private performances. When B is writing music, she disconnects from the rest of the world. She tunes it completely out. It's when she's gone the longest that I know she's lost herself in her music, and I'm happy for her because of it. B is a born musician. She taught voice and guitar lessons for years, performed in bars and nightclubs. But that didn't satisfy her. It wasn't what she saw herself doing for the rest of her life. Now she's working on an album. That said, B isn't some freeloader. She carries her weight financially. She sold some of the songs that she's written and has a nice inheritance from a dead grandma who was apparently rich. I never met her. She was dead before I met B. Not only did B get her money from her, she also got her name, Beatrice, which is one of those vintage names someone else might hate, but not B. She adored her grandmother. A picture of them together sits on B's nightstand. When my back is turned, B steps inside. She closes the door and comes to me, wrapping her arms around me from behind. I turn to her, let her envelop me. B is in her pajamas still the cotton shorts and Kurt Cobain shirt she wore to sleep. Her dark hair hangs long and straight, because somehow, inexplicably, Bean never gets bedhead. I want to jump in the shower before they get here, she says. They, meaning the subcontractors who are working on her home. The house is old, and we're in the midst of a messy renovation. The house is full of historic elements, which we love. The ceiling medallions the original oversized windows, the library with its built-ins, the servant stairs. They tell a story. But the bathrooms and the kitchen are 70s era, thanks to some previous owner who did a hack job on them. They lack the charm the rest of the house still has. We're getting those redone, brought back to a modern version of their original state, to restore the history and authenticity of the home. There's a combination lockbox on our front door. The workers come and go whenever they want. Their workday starts as early as 7 a.m. If we aren't quick to shower in the morning, they catch us in our pajamas. These men know their way around our house because they're here even when B and I aren't. It had never bothered me before. But now, in light of what's happened over the last 12 hours, it does. The contractor came recommended from Josh, who had work done on his own home. A 1890s Queen Anne. Apparently, they're whizzes at keeping the integrity of historic homes. Meredith, though pleased with the final result, hated the invasion of privacy. She couldn't wait for their renovation to be through, she told us, saying how glad she was to have that lockbox removed from her door, to regain sole possession of her home afterward. I'm thinking now that B and I should take it a step further than that and have the locks replaced. Because who's to say one of the subcontractors couldn't have duplicated the key? It makes my stomach hurt to think about someone besides B and me having a key to our home. Any news from Josh? I ask. It's early. I don't expect B to have heard from him. But as it turns out, she has. I just saw him, she says, telling me that he was in the backyard, letting his dog out. What did he say? I ask B, measuring out the coffee and pouring it into the filter. I hope for good news, but it's not. 
Meredith still isn't home, she says. He hasn't heard from her? No, she says. Not a word. The police came last night. I know, I saw them. What did they say? What are they doing to find her and Delilah? Not enough, according to Josh. He's trying to organize a search party himself, B says. He was outside making calls this morning, appealing to family and friends to help. I told him we'd help, she says. I nod and say, yes, of course, anything, whatever he needs. I have the day off work, but even if I didn't, I would stay home and help search. Meredith and Delilah need me now. Finding them is all that matters. Leo. Now. That first night in our house, you hardly speak. You don't say anything unless Dad says something first. You keep your head hung low. You don't look at us. You call Dad, sir. He tells you not to, but you do it anyway, because you can't stop. Every time you say it, Dad dies a little inside. I see it in his eyes. You cower in the corner of rooms, looking scared as hell. You don't know what to do with yourself, with your hands with your eyes. Dad tells you to have a seat because he's so worried about your feet, which were full of glass and thorns and flint when the cops got to you. Docs had to pick it all out with tweezers. You didn't flinch, because I'm guessing that's not the worst thing that's ever happened to you. When Dad tells you to have a seat, you drop to the floor. We're in the kitchen when it happens, in a room with six chairs, yet you pick the floor. Dad looks shook, but goes on as if it's no big deal because he doesn't want you to feel all weirded out by calling you out for it. So instead, he makes turkey sandwiches, and we all eat on the stupid floor. Except you don't eat much, because two sandwiches in one day is like 500 more calories than you're used to, and your stomach can't handle it. You try to eat, you look hell-bent on eating, but you also look like you could puke. I tell you, you don't have to eat it if you don't want to, because I can see in your eyes that you think you do. When Dad goes to take your plate away, you pull back fast. You whimper a little, like you think he's going to hit you. It gives Dad pause. Sure, we both know you got roughed up while you were gone. That goes without saying. But knowing it and seeing it are two different things. I feel bad for you, thinking all the time that someone's going to sucker punch you. I've been beaten up by kids at school before. I know what it's like. Except that at school, there's always some teacher there to pull kids off me. Though that's not necessarily a good thing, because I still get in trouble for fighting, and then I get crucified by kids for being a sissy. A one-two punch. But at least I don't get killed. I doubt you ever had anyone to stand up for you. I can't help myself. I stare at you. I don't remember what you used to look like, but I've seen videos and the pictures. You look almost the same as you did before, except you're bigger now, though hardly, and what were baby teeth are big and yellow and crooked. Your hair is bald in spots. I see Dad trying not to look at the bald spots, but they're hard to miss. Kids aren't supposed to be bald. Later, I ask Dad why he thinks you're going bald. I ask if he thinks you have cancer. He gets mad at me for that. He says, of course you don't have cancer. But he never says why he thinks you're going bald. I take my question to the internet. You might have alopecia. But more likely, you're compulsively pulling your own hair out. Or it's falling out because of stress. When I read that, I feel like a jerk for thinking you have cancer. I tell myself not to stare at the bald spots anymore because I don't want to give you a complex. I wonder if you even know the bald spots are there. You talk like a redneck, which is weird as fuck since you come from an upper middle class neighborhood in the Midwest. But you haven't been to school since kindergarten, and whoever had you was probably some redneck meth head. And everything you know... You learn from him. Though mostly you don't talk, 
you just say, yes, sir, and no, ma'am. That night, the cops keep watch on our house. They sit parked in their police car, same as the news crews do. Everyone vying for a piece of you. Meredith. Eleven years before. March. I've just stepped outside. The day is expected to be unseasonably warm, nearing 60 degrees. The morning starts off cold. It's only March. There are robins in the trees, making their way back from their winter homes. The kids and I are running late. We're rushing. I glance at the time on my phone. It's 8.30. I have to get the kids where they need to be and make it to my yoga class on the other side of town by 9 o'clock. I'll never make it. Cassandra is outside with Piper and Arlo. I see them heading off to school. The school is a couple blocks away, the distance short enough that the school doesn't provide a bus. We have to walk. Either that, or I have to drive Delilah to school. I never like to drive because the drop-off line is a nightmare. Some days I drive just close enough and then let Delilah off, letting her walk the rest of the way alone. I never feel good about it. She's only six years old. But there are other mothers and other children there and also a crossing guard. Nothing bad will happen to her with so many people around. Delilah is street smart. She knows the way to go. She knows better than to talk to strangers or to be lured in by things like candy or kittens. But today I won't have to do that. I glance up at Cassandra, Piper, and Arlo across the street, heading out of their own home. They look like something out of a magazine. They're completely put together and holding hands as they trot down their stone walkway into the sidewalk. They're a picture-perfect family. Arlo is a toddler, yet he'll walk the distance without complaint. No one makes a fuss of holding hands. I look to my own children. Today, Delilah wears a dress. I combed her hair and found the elusive part, using a water bottle to tame the flyaway hairs. I managed a shower, and Leo got dressed all by himself, with his pants on the right way for a change. We don't look half bad ourselves, considering. On the outside, we're put together too. But inside, I'm all wrought up, my panic and agitation tucked neatly behind a smile. I'm getting by somehow on an hour of sleep. Hey, Cassandra, I call out, waving across the street. We speed walk to her and the kids. Hi, Piper. Hi, Arlo, I say too eagerly. Delilah beams at her friend. She offers a shy wave, one that's only waist high. She's shy because of Cassandra and me. If there were no adults here, Delilah would be uninhibited. She's the extrovert in our family. I don't know where she gets it. It must be from Josh, not me. I'm so glad I saw you, I say. Perfect timing. Do you mind if Delilah tags along with you to school? We're running late, I say, knowing that Cassandra never has any issue with walking Delilah to school. Please, Piper pleads. Cassandra says, yes, sure, of course, which I knew she would. It wasn't like Cassandra was going to say no. They're headed in the same direction that we need to go, and really, one more child isn't a burden. Delilah tries to run off without saying goodbye. Come back here, Missy, I tease. She giggles. She rushes back, wrapping her arms around my legs, and I hug back, inhaling the smell of her, a combination of syrup and shampoo. I remind her to be good, to do as Miss Cassandra says. Okay, Mommy, she says. I watch them walk away, missing Delilah before she's gone. I remember her first day of daycare. That sick feeling in the pit of my stomach at leaving my child with a person I didn't know well. 
It's lessened over the years, but has never gone completely away. It was hard for me to go back to work after the kids were born, even though it was something I needed to do for myself. Delilah has broken up the formation. Now Delilah and Piper skip ahead, laughing, while Cassandra and Arlo lag behind, still holding hands. I feel somewhat guilty for unloading Delilah on Cassandra. Walking the kids to school is a favor I rarely get to repay. But Cassandra is autonomous. She's independent. By her own admission, she doesn't like to ask for help. I never get the chance to reciprocate. I take Leo to Charlotte's. I head to work. On my way, my phone pings and I break out into a cold sweat. I glance at the phone with reluctance, knowing I have to. It might be a client in labor. It's not. What it is instead is a variation of the same text I received last night. I gasp and drop my phone, but not before I've read the message. I know what you did. You'll never get away with it, bitch. Kate, 11 years before. May. B and I meet Josh in his yard just shy of eight o'clock. It's early in the morning, but already he's gathered about a dozen people to search for his missing family. There are more on the way. Still, ours is a grassroots effort. We gather in a circle and talk about places Meredith and Delilah might be. Some ask for details about yesterday, and Josh, rubbing at his forehead, fills them in. He looks wired and high strung, but also exhausted. His eyes are bloodshot. He's twitchy. I doubt he slept much, if at all. I look around. Leo isn't here. Josh left him with the sitter Charlotte, I assume. Charlotte watches many kids in the neighborhood. Even B and me, without kids of our own, know who she is. She's a staple around here. We see her and the kids out when the weather is nice, parading around the neighborhood. Charlotte is in her late fifties. Sixty, maybe. She lives alone with her husband. I wonder if Leo knows what's happening, if Josh told him. Does he know that Meredith and Delilah are missing? I doubt it, thinking that would be indigestible to a four-year-old boy. Crayons go missing, puzzle pieces go missing. Moms and sisters do not go missing. I wonder where Josh told Leo that they are. He would have had to be confused when he woke up and Delilah wasn't there. Among our search party is the woman who owns the yoga studio where Meredith works. Josh goes to her and apologizes for Meredith's absence yesterday. He says, I hope it wasn't too much of an inconvenience. She says it was no inconvenience at all, that she and another teacher split Meredith's classes among themselves, same as they did last week when Meredith was sick, and the week before. Josh is taken aback, as are B and me. We exchange a glance. What do you mean? Josh asks, because as far as any of us know, yesterday was the first time Meredith called in sick. I watch Josh's reaction. He's a tall man, a brunette with cool blue eyes. His eyes are moist, the blue turning somehow even more blue because of his tears. Leo, wherever he is, has the same eyes. The woman feels stupid. She turns red. She's misspoken. She fights for words, saying, It's just that yesterday was like the third time in two weeks that Meredith has called in sick. You didn't know? She asks Josh, and he shakes his head. We were worried. Until a couple weeks ago, Meredith was always so conscientious. This wasn't like her. We thought there was some real health crisis, like cancer or something. And it sounds to me as if she's trying to make light of that. Meredith having cancer though I wonder if cancer would be preferable to whatever's happened. With cancer, she'd have a fighting chance. With this, I don't know. Another woman speaks. She introduces herself as Jeanette, a midwife with whom Meredith works on occasion. If I may, she says, 
explaining that Meredith had very recently made the decision to cut back on her workload, to spend more time with her family. She told Jeanette a week or so ago that she'd be taking on fewer clients, and asked for recommendations of other doulas that she could send inquiries to. I see in Josh's reaction that he didn't know this either. His expression turns thoughtful, contemplative, but also sad. He runs his fingers over a mustache and beard. Brown lines appear between his eyes, one deeper than the other. Josh, like Meredith, must be in his mid-thirties, just slightly older than B and me. He's not yet 40. I remember a conversation about whether they would go somewhere exotic when they both turned 40. It wasn't around the corner, but something they had time to think about and decide. Years away, but still on the horizon. B is the one who comes up with a strategy. It's so like B to take charge and be a planner. She divides us into groups with plans to search the town. B tells people to drive around looking for Meredith's car, to stop in restaurants and shops and see if Meredith or Delilah has been there recently. Josh gives us the make and model of Meredith's car, as well as the license plate number. The volunteers carve up the town among themselves, using major roads as their guide. B and I will stay and canvas the neighborhood, because we live here, because we know the neighbors and we know our way around. Before anyone splits, B takes cell phone numbers. She starts a group chat so we can update each other with news. Josh sends a picture of Meredith over the group chat so we have it to show around. He gets choked up when he scrolls through and finds the image on his own phone. It's a picture of Meredith with Delilah and Leo, taken recently. Meredith is a beautiful woman. In the picture, her hair is gathered into a loose bun on the top of her head. Her skin is fair, covered in freckles, and her eyes are a stunning mineral green. She's clearly of Irish descent, dressed in some kind of embroidered shift dress that's as red as the hair on her head. I feel a pang of sadness at seeing the image of Meredith, with little Leo and Delilah wrapped beneath each of her slight arms. I pray nothing bad has happened to her or Delilah, who sits beside Meredith in the photograph, tiny and nearly toothless, staring lovingly at her mom and smiling so sweetly it makes my heart hurt. I may never have kids. B and I talked about the possibility of using donor sperm to get one of us pregnant. We got so far as to discuss which of us would be better equipped to carry a baby. B, who's larger in stature but also more maternal than me. And whether we'd want a sperm donor we knew, or if we'd prefer to keep it anonymous. I wanted to keep it anonymous, but that was too impersonal for B, too cold. She wanted to use the sperm of someone we knew, which felt weird to me. B and some man we knew having a child together? That's where the conversation ended. My eyes move to B's now. She stares over my shoulder at the picture. Her eyes are misty like mine. They'll turn up, she says, her hand on my arm. And though she sounds so certain, she's thinking the same thing as me. What if they never come back? We've grown close to Josh and Meredith over the years. We've grown close to their kids. They're fine. They have to be fine, B says, voice trembling, fighting tears. And I wonder if it's only wishful thinking. Are they fine? My gut tells me they're not. One by one, people get in their cars. They pull away, dispersing in different directions. B and I turn and move slowly down the sidewalk. We're quiet, each processing what's happening. The idea of something bad having happened to Meredith and Delilah is unfathomable. I won't let my mind go there no matter how much it keeps drifting. I have to stay positive, for Josh's sake, for B's sake, for mine. As we walk, B slips her hand into mine. It feels good, having something to hold on to. We make our way to the first home. I knock, and when Roger Thames answers, I ask if he's seen Meredith. Roger is limping. He threw his back out working on his car, he tells us. That was last week, and he's hardly left the sofa since. He hasn't seen Meredith. What's the matter with her? He asks abruptly. B says, 
If you see her, can you just let Josh or us know? I've never liked Roger much. We turn and make our way back down the walkway and to the sidewalk, moving on. Could she just be at a birth? Asks Gwen, the woman who lives on the opposite side of Meredith and Josh. Gwen is a widower. For three years now, her husband has been dead. Lou Gehrig's disease. I didn't know him well, but I remember that he went quickly. To me, it seemed like I'd no sooner heard the news than I read the obituary in the paper. I tell Gwen no, that we don't think Meredith is at a birth because of the fact that Delilah is also missing. Little Delilah? She gasps, her hand going to her mouth. I'm afraid so, B says. Delilah is high-spirited. She's full of life. Everyone adores her. Delilah colors pictures for me on my sidewalk with chalk. I find bouquets of dandelions on my front porch from her. Last year, when I broke my hip, she carried my mail to the door every day. She's a darling girl. Her voice cracks as she says it. I'm afraid I haven't seen Delilah or her mother for a couple of days. The weather, she tells us, has kept me inside. I say, the weather has kept many people inside, I fear. Because of the relentless rain, everyone has been cooped up for days, blind to what's happening on her streets. B tells Gwen the whole story. As she does, Gwen's eyes fill with tears. You'll let me know when there's news, she asks. Gwen would join the search party if she could, but Gwen is nearing 80 and not as mobile as she used to be. We'll let you know the minute we hear a thing, I say. Most of our immediate neighbors know Meredith, though no one has seen her. They almost all want to talk. They step out onto their front porches and ask for details. Has something happened to her? They ask, everyone concerned. Meredith, like Delilah, is well-liked throughout the neighborhood. She's been known to drop everything to help a neighbor in need. When Gwen's husband was gravely ill, she helped get him in the car and drove him to doctor appointments when she could. When the Timmons's little dog got out, Meredith walked miles around town, pushing Delilah and Leo in the double stroller until she found it. B and I share the little we know with our neighbors, but the information we gather in return is unremarkable. Jan Fleischer remembers Meredith's car parked in back. Tim Smith saw her pull down the alley. Were the kids with her? I asked him. He doesn't know. He didn't get a good look inside the car because there was a glare. He just knows that it was Meredith's car. What time was this? He shrugs. Eight, maybe, or nine, he thinks hard. I had an appointment at 11, so I left the house around 10.30. It was before that, sometime before 10.30, I'd say, he decides, apologizing for being unintentionally vague. He feels badly for it, knowing he may have been one of the last to see her before she disappeared. B and I move on. This morning, it isn't raining. Still, the sky is full of heavy clouds. We feel the moisture in the air. The trees drip rain from last night's storm down on us, making us wet in spots. We carry umbrellas, but we don't need them. Not yet, though the humid weather does nothing for my hair. There are twigs everywhere, torn savagely from the trees and tossed to the street by the rain and wind. The sidewalk is riddled with puddles. B and I part ways and step around them. It's chilly outside, no more than 60 degrees. But the gray skies, the threat of rain, and the relentless wind make it feel more like 50. I didn't think to bring a coat, and I regret it. We cross the street and go to the house directly opposite Josh and Meredith's. It's a gray house that belongs to a young couple with kids. B and I don't know the Hanak as well because families with kids tend to bond better with other families with kids, and B and I don't have any kids. But I've met them once. The Hanakas are friendly with the Dickies. I've seen Delilah and Leo riding bikes on the sidewalk with their daughter. I've seen Meredith and the other woman, Cassandra, talking on the street, laughing. Meredith likes Cassandra, I can tell. She speaks of her often on the nights Meredith, Josh, B and me share a drink on the porch. It's never anything much, but somehow her name always makes its way into a conversation. Cassandra said the new bakery on Jackson has the best cinnamon scones. 
Cassandra and Marty are planning one of those Alaskan cruises next summer with the kids. Cassandra told me that a little baking soda and vinegar in the drains will get rid of those annoying fruit flies. Josh teased Meredith about it, said she had a girl crush on Cassandra, before looking mortified and apologizing to B and me, as if he'd said something to offend us. I don't know much about Cassandra and her husband, Marty. Most of what I've heard is secondhand from Meredith. I know that they moved from the city. I know that, like B, they didn't relish the idea of suburban living. Yet, as their daughter approached school age, they had to choose between an extortionate private school education, a shoddy public school system, or moving to the suburbs. They came here. B and I step up to the door and knock. Cassandra comes. When she draws the door open, the house behind her is quiet, still. I hope we're not bothering you, B says. No, Cassandra says, not at all. I just put my little guy down for a nap. A cat circles her ankles. Cassandra scoops it into her arms and invites us inside. You two look cold. Let me get you some coffee, she says. And we step out of our shoes and follow her down the hallway and to the kitchen. Cassandra's home is tastefully decorated. Everything is in neutral tones and a touch too nice to belong in a home with little kids. It's also immaculately clean. Cassandra seems like the type. She's immaculate herself. She sets the cat on the ground. You're here about Meredith, she says, taking the glass carafe from the coffee maker and filling it at the sink. Cassandra is tall like B. She's blonde with shoulder-length hair that parts at the center and frames her face. She wears a maxi dress that a woman my height could never get away with. I envy her for it. Cassandra knows about Meredith. Of course she does. She, like us, would have been one of the first people that Josh went to when he realized Meredith was missing. It's awful what's happened, she says, back at the coffee maker, generously scooping ground coffee into the filter. I can't believe that she and Delilah are just... She pauses, a pregnant pause. Gone. She reaches inside a cabinet and pulls out three matching mugs. She sets them on the countertop. As the coffee begins to percolate, Cassandra suggests that we sit down at the kitchen table and talk. I haven't seen her in a few days, if that's why you're here. This weather, she laments, sliding gracefully into a wooden chair across from B and me. It's ridiculous. We've hardly been able to get outside at all. Piper has been begging for a play date with Delilah. She absolutely adores her. Just this morning, Piper was asking if Delilah could come over after school. I put her off, told her I thought the Dickies had plans this afternoon and that Delilah wouldn't be able to play. I've never lied to my kids before, but I didn't know what else to say. Piper is inquisitive, always asking questions. She wanted to know what the Dickies were doing that Delilah couldn't play. I said they were going to the dentist. She asked if Delilah had any cavities. I said I didn't know. I hate lying to her. If Delilah doesn't come home soon, I don't know how I'll ever be able to tell Piper that something terrible has happened to her little friend, she says. This would be hard for a child to understand. It's hard for me to understand. The area where we live is an area of low crime. Compared to national statistics or even the statistics of suburbs nearby, Crime is nearly negligible. I'm so worried, Cassandra says about Meredith and Delilah. Josh must be beside himself. He's organized a search party, I say. And she tells us, she knows, that she plans to join the search just as soon as Arlo is up from his nap. B tells her that Josh is in the process of pulling together a list of phone numbers for Meredith's clients, family, and friends. When he does, B says. There will be people to call. Perhaps you can help with that while your son is napping. Of course, anything I can do. They'll be okay, won't they? Cassandra asks. Neither B nor I reply. We're quiet, contemplating the question. Will they be okay? No one knows. No one can say for certain. But Cassandra is staring at us, asking earnestly whether Meredith and Delilah will be okay. A tear leaves her eye, weaves down her cheek. I'm moved by the sudden show of emotion. Cassandra pushes herself from the table and goes to the coffee maker. She fills the mugs, asks how we take our coffee. 
She gathers the sugar and milk. With her back turned to us, she says, I saw something. Her words are quiet, but charged, full of meaning. They send a sudden shiver up my spine. I find myself wanting, desperate for more. Did Cassandra see something having to do with Meredith and Delilah's disappearance? She goes on, back still to us. I'd forgotten all about it, she says. It came to me only after Josh called to tell me Meredith and Delilah were missing. What'd you see? B asks. Only then does Cassandra turn back to face us. Someone outside their house, in the middle of the night, she says. And then she makes the first of three trips to the kitchen table to deliver the coffees. When, I ask. A couple weeks ago, she says. Did you tell Josh, I ask. No, she admits. I haven't, not yet. I forgot, I only remembered late last night when it was too late to call and wake him. This morning, her daughter Piper was around, and so she couldn't call and tell Josh then. She didn't want to scare Piper. By the time Piper went to school, the search was in full swing. Cassandra didn't feel right stealing Josh's attention away from the search. Arlo, my son, she explains. He's a lousy sleeper. We're trying to sleep train, but easier said than done. Anyway, that night, the night that I saw someone, he was wide awake, crying. I was in his room trying to rock him to sleep. His room faces the street, she says. And without her saying it, I understand that Arlo's bedroom has a bird's eye view of Josh and Meredith's home. We never do pull the shades. We didn't when we lived in Chicago. You know what they say about old habits. They die hard, I say. There's a tremor to Cassandra's voice when she speaks. Whatever she witnessed out Arlo's bedroom window that night has her suddenly spooked. What exactly did you see? B prompts. My pulse quickens in anticipation. I wrap my hands around my coffee, but I don't drink it. I hang on to Cassandra's every word. It was dark out, Cassandra says. A moonless night. The streetlight outside has been out a month or two. My husband Marty called the city about it a while ago, but it still hasn't been fixed. Our tax dollars, she quips, hard at work. The only light came from whatever porch lights were left on overnight. For as dark as it was, I still saw movement in Josh and Meredith's yard. At first I thought it was my imagination, that I was seeing things. It was late and I was tired. Then when it didn't go away, I told myself it was their trees or a deer, a coyote maybe. But the longer I watched, I realized it was someone, people, in Josh and Meredith's yard. I watched for a while, not sure what they were doing, wondering if I should call the police. Did you call the police? B asks, knowing the answer. I wish I had, Cassandra says regretfully. How many people did you see? I ask. Two, she says. It didn't look like a break-in attempt. The people I saw, they weren't flush against the house. They were farther back, away from the door. I convinced myself, once I knew that what I was looking at was human, that they were college students heading home from the bars. It was after one. The timing felt right, she says. Bars in town close at one o'clock during the week. There is student housing, both off-campus housing and residence halls just blocks from our home. It's entirely possible that whoever Cassandra saw that night were overserved college students heading home from a night at the bar, in which case, they were most likely doing something stupid but harmless that didn't require intervention by the police. I probably wouldn't have called the police either. Did you get a good look at them? Do you know what they look like? She shakes her head. It was so dark. What were they doing? I ask. Could you tell? I couldn't, she says. But whatever it was, it didn't last long. How long? I don't know for sure, she says. Arlo had me distracted. He was all worked up, totally inconsolable that night. I was worried about him waking Piper and then having to deal with two crying kids in the middle of the night. I thought about opening the window a crack to see if I could hear something, but with Arlo crying, she says. It would have had the adverse effect. It would have just scared them away. I should have called the police, 
or at the very least thought to tell Josh and Meredith about it the next day. Why would you? B asks, trying to buoy Cassandra up. Drunk college kids is hardly news. They probably stopped to take a pee on the lawn. But what if it wasn't just drunk college kids? She asks. Listen, B says, reaching out to lay a reassuring hand on Cassandra's arm. Don't beat yourself up about it. The police will be at the Dickies today. I'll talk to them. Maybe someone on the block has a home security system they can pull. Video surveillance. I tell her, that's a good idea, B. I don't know that any of our neighbors have video surveillance on their homes. Even if they do, I don't know how much storage those cameras have. I don't know if they keep footage for weeks or if it's the kind of thing that disappears after a day or two. But it's worth a try, because maybe it was drunk college kids heading home from a night in the bars. Or maybe it was someone else. B and I drink our coffees quickly. I'm anxious to get back on the street and continue the search. We say our goodbyes. Cassandra walks us to the door, stepping outside with us. She watches us leave. We move on, following a path of stepping stones through her sodden lawn, leaving Cassandra on her front porch alone. We stop at other homes on the block. When we reach the end of it, we turn the corner and keep going. Along this next block, many of the houses belong to the college. Some are administrative buildings or the private homes of professors, while others, the more unkempt of them, those with sofas on porches and beer bottles in plain sight, belong to students. Graduation was a few weeks ago. The summer session hasn't begun. Most of the houses we come to are vacant. No one is home. We keep walking. It's mid-afternoon when, a few blocks from our own home, we come to the house of Shelby Tebow. We know which is hers because it's been all over the news. Hers sits outside the historic district and is one of the last original homes that remains on a block of teardowns. It's mid-century, surrounded by brand new custom homes that start in the seven figures. There are yellow ribbons tied to the trees up and down the street. A street pole bears Shelby's face the word missing in big black print, the sign itself encased in a plastic sheet protector to save it from the rain. I've seen this same sign around town, in store windows and on restaurant doors. There are flowers laid on the sidewalk just before her home. A kind gesture, and also a grim reminder of what's happened here. I tell B that I think we should skip the Tebow's house, Something about going to the home of a missing woman to inquire about another missing woman feels in poor taste. But B disagrees. We should go to their house because of the similarity, not despite it, she says. And I know then that she's right. I've heard Jason Tebow has a temper. I've seen it in press conferences on TV. But B isn't scared. She takes the lead, and again, I envy her assertiveness. B is a born leader. With hesitation, I follow her down the narrow walkway, up a single stoop and to the front door. She knocks on the storm door. The sound of it is empty, hollow. It would never get someone's attention. She rings the doorbell instead, and immediately, the sound of footsteps on the other side of the front door startles me. I'd been wishing no one was home. The door pulls abruptly open, Jason Tebow stands there before us. There's an infant in his large arms, drinking from a bottle that Jason holds. He's bull-necked. He's not tall, but he's well-built and wide. He fills the doorway, the storm door still separating us. I can tell straight away that he's annoyed we're here. He huffs, curses under his breath. For fuck's sake, he says, words full of vitriol. And instinctively, I step backward. B doesn't. She's not scared. I don't think there's a thing in the world that could scare B. He scowls and asks, What's the problem? Can't you read? While pointing to a no soliciting sign on the front door. Truth be told, I didn't see the sign. But I don't know that it would have stopped B if she did. He looks us up and down, taking in our sweatshirts and jeans, our sneakers. We're sorry to bother you, B says. Mr. Tebow, isn't it? she asks, introducing herself and then me. I watch the manner in which he holds that baby. It's awkward and stiff. 
He doesn't know what to do with it. Our friend, B begins, has been missing for almost a day, since yesterday morning. We're out knocking on doors to see if anyone has seen her. At this, Jason Tebow turns gray. He swallows hard, his Adam's apple prominent in his neck. I watch him. Jason is built like a bodybuilder. His arms are as big as my thigh. Is this some kind of fucking joke? Jason asks, stepping outside, letting the storm door slam shut as the baby begins to cry. The bottle has moved from its mouth and is dripping milk onto its cheek. I don't know if the baby is a boy or girl, because the onesie it wears is white, but dirty, stained with spit up. There's hardly a person in town who doesn't think that he did something to hurt his wife. Twice that I know of, he's been hauled down to the police station for questioning. At random times, police cars are parked in the street outside his house, watching him. He thinks we're harassing him, baiting him. I speak up. You don't understand. This has nothing to do with your wife, Mr. Tebow. Our friend, our next door neighbor, didn't come home last night. Neither she nor her little girl. Her husband is worried sick. His little girl, Delilah, is only six years old. You, more than anyone, can understand what he's going through. We're just trying to help find them. We've been to every house for three blocks, asking if anyone has seen them. Meredith Dickey, I say, reaching into the back pocket of my jeans for my phone, so I can show him the picture. We're a few blocks from where we live. Jason Tebow wouldn't know who she is. But he does. The recognition is evident right away. He falls a step back, turns slowly to me and asks, Did you say Meredith? I take a breath. You know Meredith? He pauses. As he does, his anger wanes. His tone softens, becoming civil, less vitriolic. I know Meredith, he says. How? I ask. She was Shelby's doula, he says. I stiffen. My stomach churns. She was? I ask, my mouth like cotton. It's gone suddenly dry at the realization that Meredith and Shelby knew one another. I try and swallow, but the saliva gets stuck in my throat. Meredith and Shelby had a connection. Now they're both gone. Is that a coincidence? Or is that something more? How long had Shelby known Meredith? B asks. Jason shrugs. Not too long. A few months. They were friends? Not really. Shelby liked her, sure, he tells us. But it was a business arrangement. Shelby was worried about giving birth. This was her first, and she doesn't have a high threshold for pain. So you hired a doula? I ask, and he nods. Why Meredith? He shrugs. He doesn't know how Shelby came upon Meredith. How old is your baby? I ask. Six weeks. Grace, because that was Shelby's middle name. Shelby Grace, he says. His use of his wife's name in the past tense isn't lost on me. This one here is Grace Eloise. That's lovely, I say. B asks if Shelby and Meredith kept in touch after Grace was born. Some, Jason says, shrugging. From what we know, Meredith remained close to many of her clients even after they'd given birth. They'd call with questions on breastfeeding, diaper rash, Meredith humored them because she's a selfless person, though contractually she wasn't required to do anything after the baby was born. Were you at the birth? Asks B. Yeah, Jason says. It was a fucking nightmare. A nightmare how? I ask. It just was, he says, turning reticent. I can't talk about it. His eyes drop to the baby in his arms, and only then does he see the spilled milk. Does he notice that the baby is fussing? He inserts the nipple back into the baby's mouth and the baby settles. Her squirming limbs become inert. When Jason looks back up at us, his eyes are wet. He asks about Meredith and Delilah. How long have they been gone? Her husband saw her yesterday morning. That was the last time, B says. Shame, says Jason. From his tone, I can't tell if he's being sincere. I find myself watching him. 
I wonder if he's the kind of man capable of hurting his wife. And if he is, is he the kind of man capable of hurting Meredith and Delilah? But why would he? What kind of person hurts a child? There are holes in his story about the night Shelby disappeared. There are accounts from friends and neighbors that Jason and Shelby fought often, that Shelby was seen with bruises on her arms and legs. Jason's excuse was that Shelby was on medication that made her easily bruise. It seemed he had an excuse for everything. Why had she gone out running so late that night? She'd just been given permission to exercise and was trying to shed the baby weight. According to Jason, Shelby thought that she was fat. After the baby was asleep was the only time she could run. The way he said it came off as misogynistic. I told her not to go, he said then. It's not my fault that she's gone. In essence, what he meant by that was that it was Shelby's fault. He tried to retract that later, in a press conference, when asked by a reporter. He said it wasn't what he meant to say, that he wasn't actually trying to blame his wife for her own disappearance. But by then, it had already run in the paper. There was no taking it back. Public opinion of him had already formed. Any leads on Shelby? B asks. The cops used their dogs to track her scent a couple of blocks. Then it disappeared. They think that was where she was snatched. They used luminol and found blood there, on the street. Someone tried to clean it up, or the rain washed it away. No idea who, she asks. None yet, but I've got my ideas. It surprises me. You do? Shelby didn't have many enemies, he says. But she had one. Who? I ask on edge. I don't know, Shelby. I don't know what kind of person she is or was, if she was the kind to make enemies. He thinks a while. He isn't quick to say. He looks around as if we're being watched. Dr. Feingold, he tells us in time, his words weighty. Who's that? I ask. He waits a beat. He's already said more than he wants to say. But then he says, her obstetrician. Why were they enemies? I ask. I can't talk about it, he says, and our conversation ends abruptly there. Jason decides that he needs to get the baby back inside, out of the rain, which only then begins to fall. It starts as a drizzle, but soon comes down in sheets. B and I watch as Jason Tebow turns with that infant awkwardly in his arms and pushes his way through the door. He lets it slam loudly closed, startling both the baby and us. On the other side of the door, the baby begins to scream. We turn and make our way back down the walkway. What do you think he means by that? I whisper as we reach the sidewalk. B shakes her head. She isn't sure. We move on. We go to more houses. We knock on more doors. No one has seen Meredith or Delilah. The lack of information, of answers, is wearing on us. We're getting nowhere. But then, at nearly noon, a text comes through the group chat. A body has been found. Meredith. Eleven years before. March. I just barely make it to my nine o'clock vinyasa flow class on time. I start by grounding my class. I ask them to find any comfortable position. There we focus on breath. I invite my students into a deeper awareness of their current mental and physical state. I focus on mine. I use this time to try and shake off the fear I feel after having just received another threatening text. I'm not used to feeling so out of control, so frantic. But these text messages have me all worked up. I tell my class to breathe in through their noses, to let the air fill their bellies, then their chests. When they exhale, I want to hear them. I breathe as they do, trying to force myself to relax. There's no one in the world who should want to hurt me. No one has any reason to wish me dead. I'm an extremely conscientious woman. I've done nothing wrong. I lead my students in a short, guided meditation. 
we move into our warm up. We work our way toward peak pose. I move around the room. I help my students find proper alignment, trying hard to distract myself from the thoughts inside my head. The lights in the studio are turned down. The classroom is heated, the thermostat set to 90 degrees. There are humidifiers. Everyone sweats, including me. We say namaste, and then everyone leaves. After class, I have a meet and greet with a potential new doula client and her husband. Our plan is to meet at 11. It's standard protocol to see if they like me and vice versa. We've made arrangements to meet at a public spot, a coffee shop, in case they turn out to be dodgy. For all the horror stories you hear about Craigslist, people being lured to strange homes by classified ads, only to be murdered when they arrive, it seems smarter this way. It makes me feel safer to meet in a public spot. The coffee shop is new to me. It has scuffed wood floors, tin ceilings, and tables the size of postage stamps. I spot my prospective client when I arrive. She's easy to see. She's the anxious, uncomfortable-looking one with a belly the size of a basketball. She waits at a table alone. I go to her and shake her hand. Meredith Dickey, I say, smiling. Shelby Tebow, she says, shaking mine. You want some coffee? She asks. I do. The fatigue is taking over. Without caffeine, I don't know how much longer I can last on my feet. We drift in the direction of the counter. We order our coffees. Mrs. Tebow offers to buy mine. I don't object. She asks if I want something to eat. I get a cinnamon scone because, on top of tired, I'm famished. I can't remember the last time I ate, or if I even ate this morning. I remember feeding the kids and doing their dishes. I don't remember having anything myself. Mrs. Tebow gets nothing. You are not having something to eat? I ask, feeling guilty all of a sudden. I take the scone from the barista. She shakes her head. She harumphs. Look at me, Mrs. Tebow says, showing off her very pregnant self. I'm fat. The last thing I need is a pastry. You're not fat, I scold. You're pregnant. We take our coffee to a table and sit. The coffee shop is quiet, small. There are only a handful of people here, professionals on laptops mostly. These meetings are as much about me trying to impress potential clients as they are the other way around. If we like each other at the end of it, a contract gets signed. My husband says I'm never going to lose all this weight. I've gained 30 pounds, she says. She says it like it's grotesque, but 30 pounds is average. I gained at least that with each of my kids. Is your husband on his way? I ask. I didn't have time to change after class. I wear my yoga clothes with a sweater on top. My eyes are heavy, the lost hours of sleep catching up with me. Shelby fiddles with a ring on her finger. He's not coming, she says uneasily. I'm sorry to hear that. He couldn't make it? Husbands don't always make it. Sometimes they're at work or on a business trip, and sometimes they're uninvolved. It's okay, because the women who need me most are often those with husbands who show disinterest or inefficacy. Shelby looks sheepish. She lets go of her ring. She rearranges herself on her chair, takes a sip of her coffee, which I overheard her order, and no, it's not decaf. I don't judge. I didn't drink caffeine when I was pregnant, but every pregnant woman is different. Maybe a little caffeine is the one thing that gets her through the day. I've seen a lot of women over the years. Single mothers, 
Women who've been raped but want to keep their baby. Women who choose to abort a fetus based on the result of genetic testing. Being unbiased is important. Every woman is not me. Shelby shakes her head. Her hands are also shaking. Tiny ripples form in her coffee, ruining the latte art. I didn't tell him I was meeting with you, she says. She's nervous. There could be a million reasons why. Maybe she's just timid or is trying to impress me. Maybe she feels badly about her husband or she's terrified of the impending birth. Oh, I ask. I don't want her to feel strange. I reach across the table and pat her hand. Research shows the importance of touch on a person's emotions, their physical well-being, the way they respond to others. Tactile stimulation is one of the most important. I say, that's not a problem. It happens all the time, Shelby. Really? She asks. Only then do her eyes move to mine. Of course it does. It can be hard to get those men on board. It's not like they're the ones pushing a baby out of their bodies, I say with an empathetic smile. Across the table, Shelby visibly relaxes. After we talk, I tell her, you can talk to your husband and decide what you want to do. How far along are you, I ask. She says, 36 weeks. Most of my clients come to me newly pregnant. Rarely do they come at 36 weeks. She tells me why, how she and her husband just moved to town. She had an obstetrician she loved, but now she's 2,000 miles away. She also had a close family, a large support system, but now they're gone too. In essence, she's alone, with the exception of her husband. I tell her why I became a doula. I tell her about my experience giving birth to Leo. What I remember is that the hospital staff didn't pay much attention to me that night. Josh had to beg and plead for a nurse to check on me. I felt alone. I felt like I was a burden. After it was done, I wished I had had someone to advocate for me. Someone other than Josh, whose emotions were running on high like mine. I've since seen things happen in a labor room that appall me. My own birth experience was a cakewalk in comparison. A common belief during labor is that a baby's needs supersede that of the mother's. Women don't always know they have options, or they aren't given a choice in their care. If they are, they aren't allowed ample time or information to come to a decision themselves. Choices are made without their consent. Too many women don't want to be a burden, and so they say nothing. The mistreatment is subtle, too, and falls under the guise of medical care. Doctors do things that verge on sexual assault to me. They stick their hands inside a woman's vagina without telling her first. They disregard a woman's pain. They use forced or invasive practices. In the labor room, no doesn't always mean no. Most times, labor ends with a happy ending. Women put aside whatever negative feelings they experienced during birth because they got what they wanted in the end, a healthy baby. That doesn't make it right. One of the reasons I do what I do is to advocate for women during birth. Continuity of care is important. To have someone who is there for you and only you during your labor. I leave it at that. We talk about a birth plan, what she wants out of this birth. A healthy baby, that's all, she says. She reaches down to set a hand on her midsection. I ask questions. I learn that Shelby doesn't want to deliver at home. She wants to deliver in a hospital. I don't need any of that new age crap, she says. I mean, I want the epidural. I don't want a C-section unless I need it. Then I want it. 
But I won't be eating my placenta anytime soon. That gets a laugh out of me. It feels like the first in days. There isn't any definitive research into the benefits of placentophagia that I've been able to find. But if a client wanted to eat her own placenta, I wouldn't stop her. We talk a while. As we do, I find that I like Shelby Tebow. I really like her. She's practical, not pretentious. She's matter of fact. She's young, and it shows. I was once young, too. She has dreams for the rest of her life. She likes helping people. She's not working now that she and her husband have relocated. But when she's able, she wants to get back to work. Her husband doesn't want her to work. He likes it better when she's home. Tell me about your husband, I say. It feels like a good transition. What about him? Oh, I don't know, I say. Anything. Her husband is an insurance agent, she tells me. He was a linebacker in college. He wanted to go pro until a knee injury sidelined him. He's still bent out of shape about it. He's three years older than her. They started dating in high school when she was a freshman and he a senior. When she turned 18, they got married. Shelby never went to college. She tells me how much he loves kids, how he'll be a great father one day. I just don't get the sense that one day means four weeks from now when their baby is due to arrive. After a while, she gets down to brass tacks. She isn't sure she can trust her husband to be there for her during the birth, physically, emotionally, or otherwise. He's kind of hardcore, as she calls him. I'm not sure what she means by that. But it's why she needs me there. The next time I see Shelby is two days later. We meet again at the same coffee shop. This time I offer to buy her coffee, but she says no, she can't stay. She's jumpy. She brings the signed contract. She presses it into my hand. I take it. Both she and her husband have signed the document. You were able to get him on board, I say, smiling. He had his reservations, she says. Shelby doesn't smile. Like what? She waits a beat before she tells me. He thinks you're a con. He thinks you're ripping us off. He looked up people in your line of work. He wants to know why you charge so much. At first, he said I was out of my damn mind if I thought we were going to pay that much for a babysitter. An image of her husband forms. Cynical, candid, lacking trust. I've been asked this question before. I'm not agency-based or hospital-based. I work alone, which is the reason my fees may be more than most. I provide services not everyone provides. You don't get just any doula when you go into labor, dependent on who's on call. You get me. He found one online that charged only $300, Shelby says. But I said I didn't want that one. I want you. Why is that? I ask. Shelby doesn't know me from a bar of soap. Why would she pick me over any other doula? She shrugs. She smiles. I like you, she says. But Jason said if I could talk you down to a thousand, that would be even better. Talk me down to a thousand? Or even eight hundred. I mean, he's right. It's a lot of money for one day of work. I have a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. I don't like where this conversation is headed. It's not one day of work. It's a prenatal appointment, meetings like this, the labor and delivery, a postnatal visit, endless phone calls and texts. It's also my livelihood. 
me putting my own life and family on hold for hers. I don't tell her that. I'm sorry, Shelby, but I don't negotiate on my fees. Another shrug, another smile, this one far more brazen. I get the sense that there's more to this woman than I originally thought. For as nervous as she was the other day, there's none of it today. Today she is assertive and sure. Which side of her am I to believe is true? Yeah, well, she says, it doesn't matter. I got him on board either way, didn't I? What I notice is that Shelby wears sunglasses, though we're inside, and outside the day is gloomy and gray. Kate, 11 years before. May, there's a river in town. It's bordered by landscaped trails that curve around the water's edge in an area known as the Riverwalk. The Riverwalk is the crown jewel of town. On weekends, people flock to it by the hundreds to visit. They walk on the brick paths, toss coins in the fountain, get their pictures taken on any number of the covered wooden bridges that pass over the river. In the heart of downtown, the paths are maintained with ample lighting, an abundance of flowers and pristine landscaping. Nary a weed grows there. The streets nearby are all upscale boutiques. The number of bars and restaurants in our downtown nears 50. On weekends, it's exasperating trying to find a place to park. But the farther from downtown you get, the river's edge turns woody. The wide, well-kept paths metamorphose into a desire line created by years of erosion from people who pass through, feet wearing away the land. The path becomes narrow, just a ribbon of dirt that cuts through the grass and weeds, enmeshed in trees. This time of year, the area is mosquito-infested. The excessive rain and flooding are the cause of this. Mosquitoes breed in damp conditions. They lay their eggs in stagnant water, like puddles. Because of the heavy tree coverage, the puddles never have a chance to fully dry out, and so the land stays muddy, mossy the ground littered with the moldy debris from trees. This is where the body was found. Our group meets back at Josh and Meredith's house. Everyone is talking fast, sharing what they know. It's frenetic. The air hums with the sound of voices, a constant drone. I look around. Josh isn't here, but there are police officers here. Their cars are parked just outside while an officer stands guard at the door. Other officers are inside the house, searching through Josh and Meredith's things. Has anyone seen Josh? I ask. He's gone to the river, someone says, to see the body. We all fall momentarily silent at the mention of that word, body. My heart is in my throat, hoping and praying that it isn't Meredith or Delilah they found. We stand in a circle on Josh and Meredith's lawn. The entire group is on edge and feeling anguished and defeated. The rain has slowed to a steady drizzle. Those of us that have them hold umbrellas over our heads to repel the rain. The rest just get wet. How do we know there's a body? B asks. My wife and I heard about it, a man says, stepping forward. How? She asks. We were on the river walk showing Meredith and Delilah's photo around, asking if anyone had seen them. There were a couple runners there. We showed them the photo. No, they said. They hadn't seen them. But they'd heard that the cops were just a couple miles down river trying to identify a body that was found. Hope that's not who you're looking for, they said. We continued to dig for details, the wife says. We asked around to see if anyone knew anything. What they derived, she tells us fighting tears, was that the body had been discovered early this morning by a man walking his dog. It was half buried in the earth. The head and the torso were concealed underground, while the rest of it poked obscurely out. It had likely been buried better, some surmise, but last night's rain may have washed the mud and the leaves away. The dog found the body first, 
driven there by the offensive scent. The river there is high, on the verge of overflowing. A day or two later and the body would have been at risk of floating away. Any signs of foul play? A woman asks. The husband and wife exchange a glance. They tell us they heard the body was unclothed, and collectively we gasp. Our minds go to the same place. Oh God, B, beside me says, taking my hand into hers and squeezing it tightly. Our eyes meet, thinking of what might have happened to our friend before her body was left abandoned and alone. Thinking of Delilah, praying that the naked body does not belong to Delilah, but also wondering, if it is Meredith, then where is Delilah? Death might be preferable to being taken by someone we don't know. Because of our close proximity to Josh's house, B and I go home and gather snacks to pass around to the search party, which now nears 30 in number. When we step into the house, the workers are there. The music is loud, something techno with a low bass that makes the entire house shake. They're hard at work, but they stop when we come in. They stop and stare. Excuse us, I say, begging their pardon for being in my own home. I feel a man's eyes on me as I collect strawberries from the refrigerator, wash and slice them in the kitchen sink. It's unnerving. B grabs two bags of chips and as many bottles of water as her arms can carry. We go back, grateful to get out of there. Everyone politely declines our offer of food. No one wants to eat. Everyone feels the same sickness in their stomach, a sadness and unrest, not knowing what's happening down there by the river. It's all anyone can think about. I myself try and imagine the scene. Police and evidence technicians, reporters, yellow caution tape, a body being exhumed from the bramble. After a while, I watch as B pulls the midwife aside. I see them talking on Josh's front porch, where they're sheltered from the rain. I'm in the middle of talking to the woman who first heard about the body late this morning. She and her husband, she tells me, tried to make their way to the body, to see it for themselves, to see if it was Meredith or Delilah. But they got only so far before the local community service officers got in their way, blocking them and anyone else from getting too close. Many people had the same idea, fueled mostly by morbid curiosity, to see a dead body. I excuse myself. I make my way to B, extending a hand to the midwife and telling her that my name is Kate. The midwife is mid-fifties with tender eyes and a kind smile. Her hair is long, graying, woven into a single braid down her back. Kate is my partner, B says. The midwife replies, Yes, of course. Meredith spoke of you often. Good things only. I'm Jeanette, she says, shaking my hand. Meredith and I work together on occasion. As a doula, Meredith worked in a variety of settings. She worked home births, often with the help of a midwife. She worked in hospitals. She went where her clients went whether they gave birth in a bathtub or a hospital bed. B is in the middle of telling Jeanette what we learned from Jason Tebow. He said Meredith was their doula. It sounds like something went wrong with that birth, but he wouldn't say what. He suggested some animosity toward the obstetrician. Dr. Feingold, Jeanette says, nodding thoughtfully. Nobody likes him much, she says. Why's that? I ask. He doesn't have the best bedside manner. He can be uncompromising. He wouldn't have appreciated Meredith being there, questioning him, undermining his decisions. To Meredith, clients came first. She didn't care who she pissed off in the process. She explains to us the role of a doula, to be there for emotional and physical support, to empower the mother, to ensure the labor and delivery were the best experience they could be. Meredith is a wonderful doula. There isn't anything she wouldn't do for her clients, she says. We talked a lot about our clients, even those that we didn't have in common. Labor and delivery can be overtaxing. The long, unplanned hours, the physical and emotional fatigue. 
It's heady and exhilarating from time to time, but also the kind of career that can run someone into the ground. We relied on each other for support. Meredith is a good friend. She is, I say, thinking of all the times Meredith had been there for me. A thought comes to me. But why would Shelby see an obstetrician like him, if he's so unlikable, I ask. Jeanette says, Shelby was already late into her pregnancy when she started seeing him. Very few OBs like to take a patient on that late in the game because they don't have a full knowledge of the patient's history. But Dr. Feingold did. Dr. Feingold was also one of the few who didn't already have a full practice, which should have been a red flag. Do you know anything about this particular birth? Asks B. I do, Jeanette says. She breathes deeply, holds the air in. At first, she's reluctant to tell us. But then she does. She exhales slowly and says, The baby isn't right. B and I exchange a glance. We've both seen the baby. The baby didn't look not right to us. How so? B asks. She suffered irreparable brain damage during the delivery. The Tebos are suing Dr. Feingold for malpractice. Dr. Feingold should have opted for a C-section, which Meredith suggested. The mother was exhausted, but Dr. Feingold wouldn't listen. He wouldn't be told what to do. He cut an episiotomy and used forceps instead, applying too much pressure to the infant's fragile skull. But she will be all right? I ask, worried for baby Grace. The fact that Shelby is suing for malpractice concerns me. Lots of doctors get sued. As a doctor myself, it's one of my biggest fears. Many malpractice suits are settled or dismissed before they ever get to court. But still, it has lasting effects on a doctor's finances and reputation. If Dr. Feingold is the type of man Jeanette paints him to be, I wonder what kind of reaction he'd have to being sued. Jeanette shrugs. We may not know for some time. Some of these children are diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Some seizure disorders. Still others have developmental delays. Meredith planned to testify against Dr. Feingold. She wants to give a deposition this week, she says. And for a second, I don't breathe. I think that this doctor did something to silence Meredith, so she couldn't speak out against him. The timing is significant. First Shelby went missing, and then Meredith, the two women who were witness to his negligence. We go quiet, each lost in our own thoughts. In time, Jeanette drifts away, standing under a tree in the distance, staring upward at the clouds. I watch her for a moment. I have a bad feeling about this, B says, stealing my attention away from Jeanette. The rain picks up and then slows down. Dusk seems to come sooner than usual because of the rain. By late afternoon, it's turning dark, the clouds heavy and gray. Tonight, there will be thunderstorms, some violent, newscasters predict. Later, early in the evening, we watch as Josh's car pulls down the street. He parks in front of the house. He stays there, not getting out, while the rest of us watch on expectantly. We hold our collective breath, wondering what Josh knows that we don't. Is Meredith dead? I see him through the windshield. He sits in the car a while, bent over the steering wheel. Is he crying? Or is he just collecting his breath? I think about approaching, of going to the car, knocking on the window and getting his attention. But Josh deserves this second of peace. He's been gone for hours. It's nearing five o'clock. For the last few hours, the rest of us have been gathered on his lawn, holding a near silent vigil. Everyone stayed. Even with the weather as it is, no one left. No one would leave until they knew what was happening down there by the river. When he steps from the car, Josh's body sags. He trips over the curb, stumbling like he's been drinking. But Josh isn't drunk. His shoulders round forward, his head dropped so far his chin practically touches his chest. He has been crying. Though his tears are dry now, the evidence is written all over his face the redness and the swollen eyes. 
He looks a decade older than he did this morning, and entirely spent. There's dirt on his hands and on the knees of his pants. He makes his way to us, but partway across the lawn, he stops. He leans heavily against a tree, burying his face into his hands as if he can't go on. There he sobs, his whole body convulsing. And 20 feet away, B wraps her arms around me, steadying me so I too don't collapse. The worst has happened. Meredith is dead. No one goes to him. We all stand by and let him have this cry. Many among us begin to cry too. My hand goes to my mouth, expecting all the emotion that's welled up inside me to come flooding out. But it doesn't. I hold it inside, focusing instead on what needs to be done. We need to find Delilah. The search for her needs to be amped up. We can't stand around and mourn Meredith's loss when we have Delilah to find. Behind me, B quietly cries. We've switched roles. Usually I'm the more emotional, B the logical, the one orchestrating plans. But B and Meredith were close. B and Delilah were close. There will be a funeral. Arrangements will have to be made. B and I will help Josh with the arrangements. He shouldn't have to do that alone. He'll be completely beside himself now that Meredith is dead. Those words get trapped in my head. They're incomprehensible to me. Meredith is dead. They don't belong together. But when Josh finally manages to collect himself, he tells us, it's not her. He chokes out. What do you mean it's not her? Someone asks. The body, he says. It wasn't Meredith. It was that Tebow woman. He cries out, and God help me, I feel the greatest sense of relief. My knees buckle, and only then do the tears come. Tears of relief that it's Shelby and not Meredith. He tells us how Mr. Tebow came down to the station and identified her body. What happened to her? Someone asks. How did she die? It's a question we all want to know, but only one of us has the nerve to ask. We won't know until after the autopsy, Josh says. But he tells us that Shelby's death is being investigated as a homicide. It was clear that foul play was to blame. Everyone gasps, then falls silent. Just then, a plainclothes officer steps out of Josh and Meredith's house. A woman, a brunette with strong features, an angular jawline, straight nose, jutting cheekbones. Her lips are thin. Her eyes narrow, cheeks taut. She could be pretty if she smiled. She wears a pantsuit, a holster with a handgun tucked beneath the jacket of it. The wind blows, pulling the plackets of her jacket apart. And I see it, the gun. She crosses the lawn for Josh, some male detective with a lesser pay grade following behind. Stupidly, I think that she is going to comfort Josh, to give him some statistic, to say something reassuring about investigations like this. But instead, when she speaks, her voice is flat and comfortless. Mr. Dickey, she says. Detective Rowlings. She flashes a badge. If you wouldn't mind stepping inside with us for a minute. While making a motion toward Josh's home behind him. I look. It's a beautiful home. A blue Queen Anne over a century old. It's large and ornate, with round towers and cone-shaped roofs that give the impression of a small castle. As long as we've lived here, Josh and Meredith have lived here. Josh stands upright. He wipes at his eyes, dries the remaining tears. Everyone else stands at attention and leans in to listen. Josh looks around. He sees the mass of people waiting there for news. Every man, woman, and child here has set aside their own day for Meredith and Delilah. If you have something to say about my wife, Josh says, fighting for composure. You can just say it. Everyone is here for the same reason, to find my family. There's no news, sir, Detective Rowling says grimly, shaking her head. 
We have some questions for you. What kind of questions? Josh asks. If you wouldn't mind, she says. We'd prefer to discuss this inside. A van pulls down the street. It comes to a stop behind Josh's car. We watch as a man and a woman in Tyvek get out of the van and head for the house. I swallow against a lump in my throat. They found something. I have to pick up my son, Josh says. He looks at his watch. I have to pick him up from the babysitter. I told her I'd be there by five. I'm already late. Can this wait? He asks. Couldn't you make other arrangements for your son? Detective Rowlings asks, promising this won't take long. She's unsympathetic. I doubt she has children. B steps forward. We'll get him, she says to Josh. Kate and I will get him and keep him until you're done. She touches Josh's arm. That'd be a big help, Josh says over his shoulder. Thank you, B. While dozens watch, Josh, with his head hung low, follows the detective to his house and closes the door. Leo. Now. Dad tells you you'll sleep in your old room, because where else would you sleep? Still, it's weird having someone in that room. No one's been in that room for as long as I can remember. Dad has to show you where your room is because you don't know. You also don't know my name. After half a day of assuming, it becomes evident you don't know. Dad tells you I'm Leo. You remember Leo, don't you? He asks. And you shake your head, which doesn't surprise me, because I'm not so memorable. He was smaller the last time you saw him, Dad says. You don't have any clothes other than the ones you're wearing, which came from the hospital's clothes closet. They were donated. I can tell by looking at them that they're not new. You're wearing someone else's old clothes. But the only clothes in your closet are a kid size six, because that's the size you wore when you were taken. They're not going to fit. Dad is tall, so he says to me, Leo, find something in your closet for your sister to wear. I still can't wrap my head around it. How when Dad says, your sister, he's talking about you. You're here, in the same room as me. You're home, or at least some version of you is home. I go to my room. I find a shirt I don't wear anymore. I find a pair of sweatpants. I bring them to you. Here, I say, holding them out. You take them. You say back, thank you, sir. I can't even bring myself to laugh, because it's pitiful that you think you need to call me your kid brother, sir. Talk about fucked up. Just call me Leo already. Old people are sirs. You stand in your doorway holding my shirt and pants in your hands. There are things I want to know. Questions I want to ask you, but can't. Questions about mom. I know the story the police came up with. What I want to know is if that's really the way it went down. Dad asks if you want him to tuck you in after you get dressed. His eyes get wet when he does. They're hopeful, desperate. I can hear it in his voice. He's begging you to let him tuck you in. It's been 11 years. You stare back. You say nothing. Dad stands down because of your silence. If there's anything you need, he says, just ask. Dad is as good as a stranger to you. It would be pretty messed up for him to tuck you into bed. You're also too old for snug as a bug in a rug. Dad stopped tucking me in when you disappeared. He was too busy crying himself to sleep to notice me. I lock my door when I go to sleep. I don't know what kind of person you are. The lady cop said you escaped because you made your own shank. Except she didn't say shank. She said an improvised weapon. You stabbed somebody with it. There was blood on your clothes when they found you. It was his. How do I know you won't stab me, too? I try to sleep. I can't get comfortable. I think I won't sleep. But then, before I know it, 
I hear Dad calling for you, screaming out your name. I look at the clock. It's 2 a.m. Somehow or other, I slept. I scramble from bed. I unlock the door and stumble from the room. When I find him, he's in the hall. He's out of his mind. His breathing is heavy. He spins in circles in the dark hall as if you're right there, two feet behind, but he can't get there fast enough to see you. I go for the light switch, turn it on. The bright lights hurt my eyes. I use a hand to shield them. Dad's sweating. He's got a hand pressed to his chest like it hurts. I'm not so sure he isn't having a heart attack. She's gone, Dad says, coming to a stop in front of me. He's wearing pajamas. Dad doesn't usually wear pajamas. Usually he wears boxer shorts. But tonight he had the wherewithal to put something more appropriate on. Because of you. Except that the pajamas are long-sleeved. He sweats because of them. I ask, what do you mean she's gone? Dad grabs me by the shoulders. He gives me a shake and says, she just is, Leo. She's not here. She's gone. Delilah is gone. I think he's had a bad dream. Something about you disappearing. It would be understandable. I go to your room to see for myself, but he's right. You are gone. The blankets and sheets are pulled all the way up like no one's ever slept in the bed. My clothes are on the floor. You didn't put them on. I check the window first. It's closed and locked. Wherever you went, you didn't go out that way. I think you ran away. But maybe your kidnapper came and got you. The fucking reporters. That's what Dad's muttering, because anyone watching the news now knows what town we live in, what our house looks like, and they know that you're here. A ten-year-old with internet access and a bike could find you. I leave your room. I check the bathroom, and then Dad and I race downstairs to scout out places you might be. We come up empty. There's no sign of you on the first floor. The front door and the back door are shut and locked. Dad's on the phone, calling the lady cop because he has her number programmed into his phone. It's the middle of the night, but that doesn't stop him. There are cops sitting right outside, but Dad doesn't bother with them or with 911. The lady cop answers immediately. Carmen, it's me, Josh, he says breathlessly. His informality makes me want to gag. I leave. I go from window to window, trying to figure out which way you went. You have no shoes. So whichever way you went, you went barefoot. But that's nothing new to you. I make the rounds. The windows are shut. They're all locked. You didn't go out any of them. I head back toward the kitchen. I pass by the basement door on the way there. I don't know why I look, except that I'm running out of options. I open the door. It's black down the steps. The basement is unfinished because even though mom hoped to finish it one day, it didn't happen before she tried to slash her wrists. Tried being the operative word because she failed. The cuts were shallow, not enough to bleed out. There were a whole bunch of them, but they only got the surface veins. Mom didn't get down to either of the main arteries, the ones that would have killed her. According to statistics, most people who try to slash their wrists fail because it hurts. That's when mom turned the knife around and stabbed herself in the abdomen. Easy and quick. According to coroner reports, she managed to get her own liver and bleed out. She had a nasty lump on the back of her head, too, from whacking something on the way down. I turn on a light. The basement becomes yellow. I go down the steps, and there you are, sprawled on the concrete floor. At first glance, I think you're dead. But then I see that your chest is moving. You're breathing. You're not dead. You're asleep. You passed on a soft, warm bed to come sleep on the cold, hard basement floor in the dark. Because for 11 years, it's all you've known. In some effed up way, you find comfort in it, being down here, in our dark, dingy basement. It doesn't get much more fucked up than that. Meredith. Eleven years before. March. In the middle of the night, my cell phone pings. 
It's been four days since I've received a threatening text. Somehow I've put them out of my mind. Since nothing bad has happened to me, I've convinced myself there's some stupid teenage prank. Some kids must have gotten a hold of my name and number and are having a field day messing with me. When the text comes, my first thought isn't that it's a threat. My first thought is that it's a client in labor. I have two women due soon. I never go to bed with the guarantee that I'll be able to sleep the night through without having to go to a birth. It's a hazard of the job. Beside me, Josh stirs at the sound of the phone. It's a pre-programmed response. He's gotten used to this. He rolls away from me. He pulls the covers over his head. I reach for the phone. I glance down at it, the light from the screen burning my eyes. I'm scared, it reads. The text comes from Shelby Tebow. I sigh. I prop myself on my elbows to reply. Shelby is scared of giving birth. Many women are. I was too, for both Delilah and Leo. It's a fear that doesn't necessarily go away, even after your first. With Delilah, everything went right. With Leo, it all went wrong. If I was to have a third, I'd still be scared. But the middle of the night is not the ideal time for a pep talk. Some clients don't toe the line. They think that because they're paying for my services, they have access to me around the clock. Such is not the case. My rules are laid out in the contract. If they're in labor, then I'm at their beck and call. But if they have cold feet, they'll still have cold feet during normal business hours. This is something I'd be glad to talk about tomorrow. I write back, all first-time mothers get scared. It's normal. Try to sleep. You need your rest. Let's talk tomorrow. XO. It's an empathetic response, but one that hopefully puts the kibosh on a lengthy discussion. I'll call her tomorrow, ask if she wants to meet for coffee, and discuss. We'll make a list of her fears and tackle them one by one. Shelby doesn't write back at first. It's three in the morning. She took the hint and went to bed. But just as I'm about to return my phone to the nightstand, it pings. I'm scared of my husband, it says this time. I stare at those words. I read them through twice. I haven't met Shelby's husband. I don't know who he is. I do know that his name is Jason and the few things Shelby told me about him. I don't wake Josh. Josh would tell me to drop this client. He'd say that I don't need to be getting myself involved in some sort of domestic dispute. But I'm already involved, aren't I? Shelby paid her deposit. She and I both signed the contract. I put a copy in the mail for her yesterday. That said, the check still sits on the kitchen counter. It's waiting to be deposited. I suppose I could just give it back. I could say I've bitten off more than I can chew and can't take on another client. I have another eight women due next month. Same month that Shelby is due. The odds of two of them going into labor at the same time is good. I could apologize, recommend another doula. Shelby might leave me a bad Yelp review, but that would likely be the end of it. That's the worst she could do. I don't think she could sue. That said, the last thing I want to do is make someone else shoulder the burden. Besides, it's women like Shelby who need me the most. Women like Shelby are the reason I got into this career. To be there for women with no or unsupportive partners. I take a deep breath. I peek at Josh to be certain the covers are still over his head. Did he hurt you? I ask. I remember the sunglasses the last time I saw her. She was hiding something. 
either red swollen eyes from crying or a black eye. I think of all the things that she could say in reply. She could tell me that yes, he hurt her, that he hit her, that he has a temper, that he screams and throws things. But abuse isn't always physical. It can be emotional too. Name calling, throwing insults, controlling her behavior, monitoring her whereabouts at all times, asserting financial control. Shelby used to work. She no longer does. She no longer has her own source of income. We think that victims of abuse should leave their spouses. We judge them for not leaving, but choosing to stay in abusive relationships. But with no job and a baby on the way, what are women like Shelby to do? She's reliant on Jason. Physical abuse worries me more than emotional abuse. But the fact that Shelby doesn't reply is most disconcerting of all. I think the worst, that he saw her texting and now he's mad. Is everything okay, Shelby? I ask. When, again, she doesn't reply, I consider going to her house to see if she's all right. The Tebow's address is on the contract. They don't live far. They live quite close, actually, in our neighborhood. It might be how Shelby heard of me. Now that I think of it, I don't know how Shelby heard of me. Sometimes OBGYNs recommend me, but Shelby's is leery of doulas. I haven't worked with him before, but his reputation precedes him. He wouldn't have recommended me or anyone else in my line of work. I have a website. There is a database of doulas where she could have found me. The fact that I can walk to her house may only be coincidental. But it would be rash for me to go to the Tebow house now by myself. It's the middle of the night. And what would I do when I got there? Just knock on the front door? If her husband isn't mad now, if he doesn't know what Shelby told me, he would be. Besides, how am I to know he wouldn't answer the door with a shotgun? People have them. I am a mother. I have my own kids. I can't put myself in harm's way for Shelby's sake. I could call the police then, ask them to do a welfare check. But what if that would only make things worse for her? Her husband would be angry if the police showed up. He'd want to know why they were there. There would be backlash. And besides, not long ago, a woman called in a welfare check on a neighbor whose door was left open overnight. When police arrived, they got spooked. They inadvertently shot the neighbor in her own home. She died as a result. I wouldn't want something like that on me. In the end, I do nothing. Indecision paralyzes me. I go back to bed, clutching the phone to my chest in case, later on, she needs me. Leo. Now. We don't need the lady cop anymore. Our crisis was averted when I found you asleep in the basement. Still, Dad doesn't call her off. He lets her come though it's the middle of the night, and her arrival sparks much interest from the hacks outside. There are lights and cameras on our house because of her. Josh, she says, as Dad ushers her quickly in and closes the door. Carmen. She takes Dad in her arms. They hold each other too long. It's embarrassing to watch. I came as soon as you called. You must be beside yourself with worry. Dad pulls back. The lady cop isn't in her usual detective getup, but the most put-together version of someone who's just rolled out of bed. I smell her perfume from halfway across the room. We found her, Dad says. Leo did. And then they look at me, as if they only just then realized that I was here. Oh, thank God. Where was she? Dad tells her. Her hand goes to her heart. Oh, my God. Dad couldn't stand the idea of you sleeping on the basement floor, 
so he woke you and sent you back upstairs. You did as told, though you were disoriented when you awoke. You weren't so sure you weren't still in that other basement. You panicked. It's okay, it's okay, I said when you did, careful not to touch you like Dad had. It's just Dad and me. Leo, you're home. You're safe, remember? You're not sure what safe means. Still, you climbed the stairs and went back up to your bedroom. You closed the door. I wonder how long you'll stay there. Good for you, Leo, the lady cop says now. I shrug. It's not like she was that hard to find. Dad tells her. I should have called and told you you didn't need to come, but we just found her a couple minutes ago. There wasn't time. I silently call bullshit. It's been at least 15 minutes since Dad sent you upstairs. Plenty of time to call the lady cop off. No, it's fine. You know I'm always here for you whenever you need me, Josh. She's staring at him. Their hands are still touching. Inside, I gag. I don't announce that I'm going to bed. I just leave, though there's no chance I'm going to sleep. I don't go into my room. I take a seat at the top of the stairs instead. I listen to what they say. One thing I figured out about the lady cop is that she has two voices. She has her cop voice, in which she thinks she's pretty badass. That's the one I always hear at the police station. And then there's her lady voice, which is the exact opposite of this. It's eager to please. Tonight, her lady voice showed up. So tell me, how's it been going having Delilah home? Their voices are hushed from the distance. Dad's chilled out some from his near heart attack upstairs, but I can tell that his nerves are still frayed. After he got you back upstairs, he cracked open a cold one and finished it in two minutes flat. I'd be lying if I said everything was perfect. It's far from perfect. She's not right, Carmen. Of course she's not. She's suffered greatly. She has. And you have too. No one mentions me and my suffering. It's been over a decade that she's been gone. She's not my little girl anymore. Don't get me wrong. I'm ecstatic to have her home. Relieved and overjoyed. I keep having to remind myself that this is real. That Delilah is actually home. That this isn't just another dream I'll wake up from in the morning, as I have hundreds of times since she disappeared. She's here, and no one's ever going to take her away from me again. We'll get there, he says. We'll get to a place where things feel normal. A new normal. Things may never be how they used to be. You did this, you know. Did what? This. You brought my baby girl back home to me. You never gave up on her. On us. You told me you'd keep looking until you found her. And now you have. I can't ever thank you enough for this, Carmen. I was just doing my job. You went above and beyond. You are still, he says. And then it's quiet for a long time. Too long. In my perverted mind, I see them sucking face, even though I've never actually witnessed anything more intimate than their sappy texts and the occasional hug. But how would I know what they do when left to their own devices? They're two lonely grown-ups, after all. The man has needs, even if the idea of it makes me want to puke. You're making noise in your room. I don't know what you're doing in there, but I know you're awake. I push myself off the floor. I go to your door. I knock. And then, because I think me knocking might scare the bejesus out of you, I call through the door. It's me, Leo. Your side of the door goes quiet. If I had to guess, I'd say you're standing there, trying to talk yourself into letting me in. How do you know that you can trust me? How do you know I'm not here to do something bad? I don't blame you for being scared. I knock again. It takes some time for you to open up the door. You don't say anything when you do. You just stand there, looking up tight. Why aren't you asleep, I ask. You don't say. You're still wearing the hospital clothes. For whatever reason, you don't want to put mine on. What are you doing in here, I ask. I look around to see what you've been up to, but the room is mostly dark. I can't see much. You give your head a little shake. Your hair falls into your eyes. 
It's schlumpy. You've got a smell to you. You need a shower. But Dad thought you'd had enough for one day. So a shower will have to wait until tomorrow. Nothing, sir, you say. Leo, I tell you, getting annoyed now. It's Leo. Lee O, I say, because maybe you don't know how to pronounce it or something. I could wear a name tag to help you remember, but I don't want to be a dick and assume you know how to read. Say it with me. Lee O. You say my name. I think there's going to be something deja vu-ish about it when you finally do. But there's nothing. Not the spark of recollection I'd been hoping for. See? That wasn't so hard, was it? You don't say either way. Why aren't you sleeping? You don't tell me. Just can't sleep? You don't say. I think it would be hard trying to sleep in a place that's brand new, surrounded by people you don't know. You were asleep in the basement, until Dad went and put an end to that. Stay here, I say. I'll be right back. I go to my room. Kicked to the back corner of the closet floor is my old security blanket. It's blue. The silk edge is torn. Why I still have this stupid thing is beyond me. I used to go everywhere with it. I'd cry without it. According to Dad, Mom used to have to dupe me to get it out of my hands long enough to wash it. Once, it got left in the grocery store shopping cart, and my world almost came to an end. I'm thinking maybe you need my blanket more than I do. I half expect your bedroom door to be shut and locked when I come back. It's not. I thrust the blanket at you. Take it, I say. What is it, you ask, feeling the texture of it, the weight. The thing's been washed so many times, it's anything but soft. It's thin. It isn't the kind of thing that would keep anybody warm. It doesn't look like much. My old blankie. My blanket. Some kids have them. Maybe you did too, I don't know. I couldn't sleep without that thing as a kid. You don't say anything. You just hold my blanket in your hands, staring blankly at it. Then me. Then it. Because you can't hold someone's stare more than a second at best. I thought maybe it would help you, you know, sleep. It used to be the only thing that made me feel better when I was sick or sad. I turn my back to you and start walking away. Three steps later, you say, Don't you need it? Then you tack on, Leo? The way you say it is unsure, like you're not 100% sure you should say it. It gets a smile out of me, though you don't see. I keep walking. I think you need it more than me, 